As the Senate begins debate this week on campaign finance reform, the first of several field hearings on the issue was held on Saturday in Phoenix. It was chaired by House Administration Committee Chairman Bob Ney of Ohio and included testimony from representatives of the American Civil Liberties Union and the Arizona League of Women Voters. The hearing runs three hours, ten minutes. The committee will come to order. Today the Committee on House Administration is holding a field hearing. And that's the purpose of why we're here today, to discuss general campaign finance reform issues. Well, good afternoon again. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here for all the committee members. And as chairman of the Committee on House Administration of the U.S. House of Representatives, I want to welcome all of you to the first in our series of committee hearings on the important subject of campaign finance reform. Uh, before we get started, on behalf of the House of Representatives and the entire United States Congress, we would like to acknowledge the tragedy that recently uh, befell uh, your community when it lost one of its uh, finest members, uh, Brett Tarver. And our deepest sympathies uh, go out to uh, the firefighter and to his uh, family, wife and, and children, um, people that are involved in, in public service and firefighters and law enforcement that every single day uh, risk their lives and put their lives on the line. And we just uh, pass our condolences on to the family and friends of, um, of Brett Tarver. I want to uh, also thank the members of the committee that have taken the time to come here to Phoenix, Arizona, to listen to the views of witnesses from across the country. And specifically, I'd like to thank Congressman Vern Ehlers of Michigan, who is uh, my immediate right, Congressman John Linder of Georgia, uh, to the far right, uh, to my left, uh, this is one of the few times Congressman Doolittle's to my left, is uh, Congressman John Doolittle of California. And uh, also uh, to the far left is Congressman John Micah of Florida. So we appreciate the members of the, of the committee that have uh, come here. Unfortunately, due to scheduling conflicts, the uh, minority members of the panel were not able to attend the hearing. I'd also like to note for the record, however, I did receive a letter from the ranking member of this committee, Congressman Steny Hoyer of Maryland, and Mr. Hoyer is fully supportive of these hearings and regrets that he could not attend, and he also personally talked to me about this, and he will be involved with uh, future hearings. Mr. Hoyer, uh, Steny Hoyer of Michigan, uh, of, um, I'm sorry, of Maryland, has been deeply involved in campaign finance reform and the election process. And uh, he's going to be a, a very active uh, member and has been with our committee on these important issues. So we appreciate a statement by Mr. Hoyer. Our uh, first panel has been seated and will be introduced in a moment. The panel members have been chosen to represent uh, diverse viewpoints on this issue, the subject of campaign finance reform, and should make, I think, for an interesting and informative hearing. I want to thank the panelists for coming. This will be the first of several hearings that this committee plans to hold in different locations around the country on campaign finance reform, and also we will have hearings in the U.S. Capitol. It's vital that the uh, committee hear from a broad perspective from people all over the country before voting on an issue that is so important to the, to the future of our country and to the uh, political system in the country. When Congress votes on campaign uh, finance reform, we'll be deciding what Americans can legally do and what Americans legally cannot do to influence the election process. I believe that is a heavy responsibility. At stake are the rights of every American to attack or defend, support or oppose those running for elective offices. The laws that govern those elections are, are critical for the future success of our democracy and our great nation. These laws concern not only members of Congress, and political organizations, but they also affect the rights of every single American to participate in the election process. Any changes in our campaign laws, I think, should improve people's faith in their government, protect their right to participate in the political process, and be fair to all Americans who want to participate in the energetic give and take of public debate. That's why I believe our campaign laws must start by protecting the right of free speech, the right of people to speak out freely on any subject, including government, politics, and any elected official or candidate. But I believe there are other important values at stake also. People should be free to associate together in political parties and other groups to elect, oppose, or just comment on candidates. 
Elections should be competitive, and the law should ensure that candidates, parties, and groups are free to get information to voters. Very simply, voters should be able to make an informed decision on Election Day. People also have a right to know who is spending large amounts of money to support or oppose candidates in office. In addition, I do not believe the law should give unfair advantages to millionaire candidates who spend large amounts of their own money to get elected. These issues raise difficult questions to which there are no easy answers. People of goodwill can, and I believe, will have differences, honest differences of opinion. I welcome all those differences. We're here today to talk about them, and I look forward uh, to the discussion. And we'll have opening statement, uh, Mr. Adlers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, will try to be brief, as I think we all should be, because we're trying to get the comments of the people here. But I just want to make it very clear that my intent, and I believe the intent of the entire committee, is to sure, be certain that we develop laws and a process that ensures the integrity of the electoral process in every, every aspect. At the same time, let's not delude ourselves into thinking that passing laws, even perfect laws, will prevent uh, people of, with lack of integrity from doing things that they should not do in order to try to influence the process of the elections. And that's one of the handicaps we work under. Secondly, I think it's very important for every citizen to recognize the strictures under which we work because of Supreme Court decisions regarding the free speech aspect of the Constitution. The Buckley case in 1974, which ruled that we, the Congress, could not limit the amount spent on election by an individual spending his own money, uh, forced us also to say we could not limit the spending of any individual. And we have to recognize that that limitation is there. More recent limitations in the Colorado case make it even more difficult to, to write meaningful campaign finance law. The, my point is that more and more the public is going to have to depend on the integrity of the candidates to make certain that campaign finance laws are obeyed and that good common sense is, is uh, done in the, not only the electoral process but also the legislative process. The, the, this, as I said, is an extremely complex issue, and I have to say I'm very concerned about the fact that the amount of money being spent is increasing, especially by those spending their own money. We all know of Ross Perot spending $100 million of his own money over uh, two elections to try to become the president. Uh, this last election, Senator Corzine spending $62 million of his own money to get a Senate seat from New Jersey. Uh, that's very troubling and yet there is not, not a thing we can do about it. The last comment is that we live in a land where advertising is essential. General Motors spends approximately $300 for, on advertising for every car they sell, and that's true across the automobile industry. We in the political arena also have to spend money to get our message out. No longer do the print and electronic media cover us adequately to inform citizens about our actions, our comments, and our positions. We have to advertise to spread the word. And all I can say, I try to keep it at a minimum. I'm a frugal Dutchman, so I don't spend very much in my campaigns. But you have to spend a certain minimum amount. But I do have to say, I am very proud that I spend about 300 times less for each vote I get than General Motors spends for each car it sells. <coughs> and you have to keep that in perspective. One other little tidbit on that. All the money spent on all the campaigns in the United States in this last election, adding it all together, is still less than is spent on advertising painkillers such as aspirin and Tylenol in the United States, just to take one example. So those people who think that's run amok recognize if that's run amok, then all advertising is run amok. Uh, we have to take all these factors into account, try to design a fair system, but especially one that assure, ensures fairness, equity, and integrity so no one can take advantage of the laws. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Doodle. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your convening this hearing and uh, giving us the opportunity to hear from uh, witnesses from a variety of uh, places and points of view with the hope of shedding light on this uh, 
uh, issue of, of campaign finance regulation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's been my observation so far, at least in really in pretty much the modern times, the last uh, 25 years or so, the debate about this issue has largely been centered uh, amongst the far left and even farther left, the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks, so to speak, where it is presumed that more regulation is desirable and is only a question of how much. I hope, Mr. Chairman, that we get from these hearings an understanding that there may be an actual alternative, a true alternative, other than the what we've seen now, basically extreme proposals and getting more extreme as time goes on. Uh, I hope the witnesses today, if they're going to tell us there is a problem with the campaign finance system, that they will tell us what that problem is and what steps they would take to address it. The, I have a, a complete statement, Mr. Chairman, which runs uh, probably seven minutes that I will uh, submit for the record. But I hope that we can shed some light on this, and I hope that Americans who are tuning into this debate understand that while this is really couched in terms of candidates, and uh, you know most of them won't be candidates, I hope they understand it's really their freedoms that we're playing with in a very, very serious way. Uh, any reform I've heard of out there, uh, at least any of the big ones that we could all name, is going to make it more difficult for challengers. It's going to make it more difficult for the average citizen to participate in politics. It's going to subject you to the possibility of being fined or prosecuted by a remote federal agency and will introduce into your life something that you will find very foreign if you ever come under the scope of its review. It'll be something like the IRS that's reviewing your tax returns now. Now it will review your activities exercising your First Amendment. And think about that and the costs of attorneys, which, what, range from $250 to $600 an hour. You're kind of at a disadvantage as an average American citizen if you should happen to incur this unfortunate circumstance. Now, for incumbents, if I wanted to do something to help me ensure my perpetual re-election, I would vote for one of these leading bills that you'll hear discussed today, either uh, Shays Meehan in the House or McCain-Feingold in the Senate. There is nothing out there that would do more to help me in my re-election as an incumbent than to have those bills pass. Why? Because I have name ID as an elected U.S. representative in my district. People have heard of me and they've heard of my positions and those who agree with them will be willing to respond to a solicitation for contributions. When I first started out as a total unknown, however, and I were, with, were I to have sent out a similar letter, nothing would come back because nobody would have heard of me. That's the inherent advantage of the incumbent. You are going, by limiting what people can do in elections, you're going to lock in the incumbent's advantages and make it harder for the challenger. Is that what people really have in mind when they say they're for the so-called campaign reform? It's really massive regulation. If, if campaign regulation works so well, then why do we have all these issues before us today? Why are we sitting here? Why are we consumed each year in the Congress with this debate over campaign regulation? After all, it's a very comprehensive scheme. There's very sharp limits that have been put in place. There's a severe regulatory scheme. And yet, the more we regulate, the worse it gets. And we're going to hear today advocates who are going to sit here and, with a straight face, tell us that we need even more regulation. You know, this is like a sick patient. If you've got the same doctor treating the patient and the patient keeps getting sicker and the remedy is more of the same, Double the dosage, it's going to get better. You're going to kill the patient. And in this case, when it comes to campaign finance regulation, the patient is all of us. It's every American who has God-given constitutional rights of free speech. We better get a new diagnosis, is my view, Mr. Chairman. And I hope...
that this series of hearings will provide the information so that we can get a new diagnosis so that the patient can get better rather than have to die at our hands. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, point of order. Uh, in congressional hearings, it is not appropriate for uh, or uh, in order for the audience to express their opinion and in these forums. That's done through their rep elected representative. Mr. Chairman, I ask that we adhere to that rule and that you advise the audience uh, accordingly. Thank you, Mr. Mike. I was going to get to this point, but uh, I was waiting until Mr. Doolittle finished and then the applause happened. So we would uh, tell the members of the audience about the uh, protocol congressional hearings. And I do realize most of you aren't aware of that, and, uh, and that's fine. Uh, and we do welcome you uh, who are in the audience today to join us. I do want to clarify, however, that this is a congressional hearing, so it's different than a town hall meeting, and members of the audience are here to listen and observe the testimony and the questioning. The testimony will be delivered by the panel witnesses. The questioning will be done by the members of this committee, uh, not by, by the members of the audience. As an official hearing of the congressional committee, these proceedings are governed today by the rules of the House of Representatives. Under those rules, uh, Article 1, as chairman, I have the power to maintain order and decorum and control the breaches thereof. Pursuant to that power, unruly or disruptive uh, members of the audience who interfere with the conduct of the, of the committee's business uh, could be removed. And um, those are the, are the rules of the House. So we ask that you refrain from, in either direction, whether you're happy or sad about something that was said of the applause. But we are happy to have you. And I would also point out, we are, without objection, we're going to leave the official record for this committee open for seven days so that if you do have comments you'd like to make, written comments, we also have staff here available, you'll be able to do that by sending it to the Committee on House Administration, room 1309 uh, in Washington, D.C. Thank you. And with that, we'll move uh, on to Mr. Linder of Georgia. Well, I had something to say, Mr. Chairman, but John Do Doodle got me so nervous and frightened, I thought I'd catch the next flight out. <laughs> um, I, th I do think there is a critical mass forming for something to be done on unregulated money. The president embraced it. Um, it passed in large numbers in the House last year, and something will pass the Senate. So my only hope is to listen, examine all the bills that are being put forth and hopefully come up with something that is not as damaging to the system as I tend to agree with John, overregulation can be. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I too, uh, Mr. Linder, liked uh, some of what uh, Mr. Doolittle said um, and uh, agree with him, even though uh, I didn't want him to get too much applause and uh, recognition in the hearing. <laughs> just so we also set the ground rules uh, for the audience today. I think, Mr. Chairman, I first of all want to congratulate you on holding uh, this uh, hearing. Far too often we uh, consider uh, these issues uh, uh, only uh, close to the Potomac, and I think it's good to get away from the Potomac and hear from uh, people around the country. Uh, probably there's no more important issue before the Congress or our committee this year, then uh, really uh, the integrity of our electoral process. Uh, if you live in a country that uh, has uh, freedom to elect uh, representatives in a de democratic uh, fashion, uh, and there's, the people have lost uh, faith in that process, there's something wrong. Unfortunately, uh, 99, fortunately, I should say, 98, 99 percent of the elected officials at the federal level or, or who run for federal office obey the laws. And uh, we find ourselves trying to build uh, traps to catch rats that, uh, uh, regardless of the law, uh, they want to go uh, astray and uh, misuse both the law and the intent of the law. The other problem we've had in this, Mr. Chairman, and having been on the committee for a while, is we have 535 experts. And uh, every member of Congress has gone through a campaign or election, uh, and each of them have their own opinion as to what needs to be reformed. So uh, there is a great diversity in opinion. 
Uh, when I ran the first time, I was hit by $5,000 contributions uh, uh, in uh, multiple, 20, 24 of them, uh, wire transferred at the last minute, and it wasn't very uh, trans uh, a transparent uh, action. Second campaign, I was hit by so-called so soft money in huge amounts. In fact, to this day, I don't know uh, who paid for the ads or where they uh, came from. Uh, and that does, uh, does distort uh, this electoral process, and each of us have been uh, victims. And uh, we need to find some ways where we can improve uh, the process, regain uh, public uh, faith uh, in the process, one of the problems that we have, and Mr. Doolittle, I think, Mr. Chairman, you spoke to it, Mr. Ellers, uh, uh, we only have one thing standing in our way, and that's our Constitution, uh, our rights the, under the First Amendment, the free speech uh, clause, uh, which does put some constraints on us putting uh, limits on what individuals uh, can spend. And certainly, we don't want this process to evolve only to where the uh, extraordinarily wealthy can win or uh, the process can be so distorted uh, by uh, individuals with great amount of money. Uh, many people were upset with uh, some of the things that went wrong with the last election. Certainly we should ban and uh, they should be banned foreign contributions, uh, people who distort the process and take uh, money from Ill illegal sources uh, should uh, be prohibited. Uh, but again, we get back to some basics, and that's our constitutional uh, right of free expression. And that does, in fact, uh, make uh, our work uh, even more difficult. I'm interested today f uh, to hear from individuals and out, out here. Uh, and uh, I guess this can't get too much further west unless you go as far as you are in California, <laughs> Mr. Doolittle. But uh, good to hear from folks out here and their opinions and ideas on how we can do a better job of restoring faith in the electoral process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I'd also like to, right before we begin, thank the mayor of Phoenix and his staff who have been absolutely tremendous in helping us to have this uh, hearing. Uh, recognize that the president of the, of the state senate of Arizona, Senator Randall Gannat, Gannant, is uh, here in the audience, State Representatives Wes March, uh, Representative Deb uh, Gollett. Uh, I should also note that uh, I had uh, personally sent a letter to Senator McCain inviting him to testify here, and he also personally sent a letter back to me. He had an uh, uh, appointment conflict, uh, so he couldn't be here today. I want to thank our House Administration staff for uh, making this possible to be here, and also uh, Congressman Steny Hoyer of Maryland has sent uh, Keith uh, Abushar of the staff, which is to our left, on behalf of him to be here. And with that, thank you very much uh, for going through our opening uh, process here. And I'd like to um, introduce our panel, uh, which to my left uh, is uh, Landis uh, Aiden, citizen activist, uh, Ann Essinger, president of the Arizona League of Women Voters, Professor Lynn Wardle, um, J. Reuben Clark Law School, Brigham Young University, and Eleanor Eisenberg, Executive Director of the Arizona Civil Liberties Union. We want to thank and welcome all of you here today, and we'll begin uh, uh, with Mr. Adden. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, I'm Landis Aiden, a longtime community activist here in Arizona in the Phoenix Mesa area. As such, I've taken an active part in numerous elections uh, as a volunteer over many years now on the federal level, congressional, Senate, and presidential elections, including past campaigns of several of Arizona's congressmen and both current U.S. senators. I've also been active in citizens groups that have taken a keen interest in such elections. A key distinction needs to be made that all of these groups are nonprofit, grassroots folks. Most, by the way, were founded with no intent or interest in being involved in politics or legislation. Nobody makes any money, nobody makes any profit beyond protecting their rights and interests. For the most part, we have no money, we give no money. For example, one group that I've been active with for many years was founded in 1909 before Arizona statehood. I've done some preliminary research and so far over its 92 year history, it has given to candidates exactly zero dollars and zero cents. 
in the interest of self-preservation and protecting its and its members' rights and interests, it does have legislative subdivision now. In the year 2000, a presidential election year, it spent a grand total of $4,433.02. That was for everything, including replacing worn-out office equipment, ISP, telephones, promotional and, yes, issue ads, etc. You just don't get any more grassroots than that. I am having a very difficult time trying to understand how our vast sums are undermining our republic. Because of, or perhaps despite, our proliferate spending, groups like ours have been fairly effective in influencing legislation and the election process. Perhaps the successes of penny players like ourselves uh, are an irritant to the, some of the rich and powerful. And looking over the latest copy of one of the campaign reform bills, among many other things, uh, the very low dollar limits caught my attention. Are these artificially low limits designed to prevent any effective or significant uh, citizen involvement? Well, I'm not a finance expert by any means. You can just check with my wife on that. I do know that to run a statewide initiative campaign will run close to a million dollars here in Arizona. And I would think that a congressional campaign would run from 600000 to a million plus. Um, is spending $1,000 or even $10,000 going to make a difference? Only if there's issues involved. Speaking of issues, we see quite a bit about the uh, phrase phony issue ads. Perhaps if uh, someone has been in Washington, D.C. far too long and has become about moi, that issues aren't all that anymore. But to us out here, issues are everything. We don't care what color our suit, tie, or dress the candidate wears, don't much care which party. We don't care how good or bad they may look in jeans. We don't care if they have or spent more money than their opponents. It is where they are on our issues. That's the important thing to us. By the way, out here, the Republicans have consistently outraised and outspent their opponents and still managed to lose. I am very concerned about the developments in campaign laws and legislation that, while seeming to be focused on the huge amounts of money going to campaigns, whether soft, hard, or scrambled, they all seem to have provisions to limit or restrict the involvement of us common citizens, especially our First Amendment rights. As the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Thomas uh, v. Collins, 1945, I'll quote them here, the very purpose of the First Amendment is to foreclose public authority from assuming a guardianship of the public mind. In this field, every person must be his own watchman for truth, because the forefathers did not trust the government to separate the true from the false for us. I am also concerned for our First Amendment rights and our right and freedom of association. Whether it is campaign laws or the tax code, it seems that many of these are designed to muzzle, gag, or discourage the common man and woman from being a participant in the election process. Does the current campaign system need fixing? It sure does. There's no doubt of that. Conversations with acquaintances in the corporate world have indicated that they feel that their contributions are more like protection money rather than uh, bribes as the media would tend to portray it, especially over these last eight years. Does money corrupt? Yes, it does, but not as much as power. John F. Kennedy's famous quote of now so long ago asks not what your country can do for you, but uh, what you can do for your country. That has been an inspiration for many of us in these grassroots citizens groups. It would be a tragedy if the federal government prevented us from doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And we'll now go on to um, Ann Eschinger, president of the Arizona League of Women Voters. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Nay and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to tell you about campaign finance reform in Arizona and the League's position. I'm here today for one reason and that is to tell you that Arizona supports campaign finance reform. We are one of four states that have passed public funding for elections. The law went into effect for the November 2000 election cycle. The only statewide race then was for Arizona Corporation Commission. I'm proud to say that three of the four major party candidates for two seats ran with public funding. This means that the two candidates elected both Republicans have not accepted campaign contributions from the industries they regulate. In the legislative races, 44 candidates ran with public funding and 16 were elected. 
a majority of them Democrats. Now, almost half of Arizona's legislative districts have a legislator who is free of the influence of special interest money. Our system is designed to remove the influence of big money campaign contributions on state government. It encourages competition and increases public dialogue. And certainly, not least, it increases the choices that voters have at the polls by enabling qualified candidates of all pro political persuasions to run for office. The two bills in the Arizona legislature this session that would have effectively gutted public campaign financing are dead. One received only the vote of the sponsor in committee. The Arizona Republic, our statewide newspaper, which would be described by most as the voice of Arizona's conservative conscience, supports, supports McCain-Feingold. There's no love lost, certainly, between the Republic and Senator McCain, but in commenting on the hundreds of millions of dollars raised by Republicans and Democrats last year, the Republic said that this money is, quote, corrupting and feeds the public perception that our elected officials are for sale. The Republic knows that this issue is bigger than Senator John McCain. We in Arizona also understand that meaningful campaign finance reform is not just about politicians and money. It is about a more re representative decision-making process. The League of Women Voters understands that true reform must correct the dangerous imbalance between the access and influence of big money contributors in determining public policy versus that of the average voter. True reform must help restore the faith of the public that they have a voice in our representative democracy. It must help erase the cynicism and voter apathy so prevalent today so that more citizens will be encouraged to participate in the political process. McCain-Feingold is a step in this direction. It will effectively ban soft money, ensure that funding for sham issue advocacy is covered by election rules, and strengthen enforcement and disclosure. The League of Women Voters opposes amendments to the bill since they would undermine the bipartisan coalition supporting it. We oppose provisions that may be offered to raise the hard money contribution limits. It is only people who have maxed out on direct, traceable contributions to candidates and people in groups who want to hide identities through anonymous contributions laundered through political parties that benefit from the ability to wage soft money campaigns. A balanced, bipartisan approach to federal campaign finance reform, one which focuses on banning soft money and closing the fake issue ad loophole, is our nation's best chance to restore citizen confidence in our political system. Thank you very much for your testimony. And now we'll move on to Professor uh, Lynn Wardle. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of this committee. It's an honor for me to appear this morning or this afternoon and express concerns about significant parts of uh, S-27. Uh, for identification, I'm a professor of law at uh, Brigham Young University. Uh, I have written a couple of articles on other free speech issues and testified before a congressional committee on other free speech issues. But I base my testimony today primarily upon my research and my own experience doing pro bono work with private public interest organizations of individuals who are trying to express their views because they want to influence the shaping of public policy on issues that matter a great deal to them. I have served at various times on the board of directors of the Americans United for Life, the National uh, Right to Life Committee, uh, and was president of the Utah Pro-Life Coalition. Uh, while I've been associated with a number of private uh, public interest organizations, my views today are my own and I'm not speaking for anyone. Like many Americans, I believe that there's a need to regulate, in some respects, campaign financing. As a young law clerk to Judge John Sirica during the Watergate cover-up case, uh, I saw the corrosive effect of huge amounts of undisclosed uh, money in political campaigns, secret transfers in brown paper bags, bag men, concealed slush funds used for un improper purposes, political payoffs to buy silence, 
And in recent years, like many Americans, I've been concerned again about sleazy fundraising activities, inappropriate use of government facilities, solicitation and receipt of foreign donations, and so forth. Thus, I begin by noting that some parts of S-27 are very appealing, including codification of the Supreme Court's decision in the Beck case, uh, uh, the sunshine principle of disclosure of who pays for ads, uh, clarification of the prohibition on political fundraising on federal property and on uh, accepting foreign campaign contributions, and uh, raising the campaign donation limits. All of these, I think, are consistent with the best American traditional uh, political traditions. However, many key parts of S-27 are very disturbing and I think are indeed threatening to fundamental rights of individuals and of groups of individuals to engage in the most essential type of civic speech protected by the First Amendment, namely political speech. Efforts to curtail political speech are inconsistent with the highest standards and noblest traditions of Congress, which has historically been the first bulwark of free exercise in this country. For 150 years before the Supreme Court ever discovered the First Amendment, Congress was protecting the freedom of speech. Now it appears that Congress uh, is set to uh, take some serious retrograde action. The Supreme Court has clearly indicated that individuals and groups of individuals have the constitutional right to spend their own money for political advertisements to promote their political views during election campaigns. Campaign finance laws that restrict individuals or groups of individuals from expressing their political views by, expert, by purchasing media advertising uh, violate the First Amendment and are unconstitutional. And there are provisions in S-27 that I think uh, fall on the wrong side of that line. Um, the very... Uh, the Supreme Court declared only a quarter century ago in Buckley that the First Amendment has its fullest and most urgent applications precisely to the conduct of campaigns for political office. One of the primary purposes of the First Amendment was to, quote, protect the free discussion of governmental affairs, of course, including the discussion of candidates. The Constitution guarantees freedom to associate with others for the common advancement of political beliefs and ideas. The First Amendment affords the broadest protection to discussion of political issues and candidates in order to assure the unfettered interchange of ideas for the bringing about of political and social change. Now, I would like to point out two flaws or concerns that I have in particular. One concern that I have is the impact on um, uh, the less wealthy. Uh, S-27 would disproportionately disadvantage the efforts of ordinary American wage earners and retirees to have their voice heard on important political issues. They cannot afford to buy broadcast time to express their viewpoints on things that are important to them. So in order to buy into the public debate, they have to pool their money their in, with contributions to organizations that espouse their views. And it's those kinds of speech that would be regulated, severely restricted, uh, by, in some respects, inappropriately by S-27. Moreover, the detrimental impact would be felt particularly by less popular speech, and uh, I think pro-life uh, speech is a primary example. When you have unpopular speakers, their positions would be particularly negatively affected. Therefore, I think S-27 uh, is very, has very serious First Amendment concerns, and I would uh, suggest that it not be passed in its present form. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Eleanor Eisenberg, thank you. Thank you, Chairman and uh, many members of the committee. We appreciate the opportunity to discuss this critical issue with you on behalf of the ACLU. I am Eleanor Eisenberg, the Executive Director of the Arizona Civil Liberties Union, a statewide affiliate of the National ACLU, and will be articulating uh, Arizona's position as well as that of the National ACLU. The issue of campaign finance reform has been debated within the ACLU for many years, and I think that there are a lot of misunderstandings about the position of the ACLU, uh, some of them stemming from as long ago as the Buckley decision, which was, uh, which was a case in which the ACLU was active. Let me make it clear. The ACLU supports campaign finance reform. Now, having said that, we must also say that we oppose the current proposals before Congress, which would purport to achieve reform 
by limiting public speech, contribution, and expenditures by individuals and organizations for the purpose of advocating on behalf of causes or candidates in the public forum. Such limitations pose serious threats to the First Amendment protections of free speech and free association. You have suggested in your opening statements that when we talk to you today, we propose alternatives. The ACLU has an alternative. The electoral process is a public process. It's therefore appropriate to have public financing of that process. The ACLU supports public funding available to all legally qualified candidates for office. The funding must be adequate to provide a floor for campaign expenditures sufficient to ensure fair public debate. Caps on contributions and expenditures have the opposite effect. They widen the divide between candidates, infringe on free speech, and limit public debate. A serious and deleterious effect of the current system of campaign financing is that those who are elected to office are less able to turn their full attention to governing because they are always having to think about raising funds, enormous sums of money required to run a campaign. If caps are in place, the situation could be exacerbated because a candidate office holder would need to spend even more time away from his or her governing responsibilities while seeking smaller but more numerous contributions. We must make it possible for those in government to devote themselves to governing rather than campaigning. Funding streams to support financing could include restoration of modest tax credits, for political contributions and increasing the voluntary checkoff on tax returns. Vouchers should be made available for media time and for travel expense. Controlling costs combined with adequate public financing would bring about true reform while maintaining First Amendment rights. More often than not, a city has but one newspaper. I think no one would suggest that that newspaper needed or could be limited in its ability to editorialize, endorse, publish stories, and those generally relate to incumbents. I think that ordinary citizens should have equal access through advertising, and it has been pointed out in your opening statements, that has become expensive. It's an oversimplification to say that Buckley says money equals speech, but as a practical matter in today's society, in order for have our speech heard, or our speech seen, if you will, we do need money. Nonetheless, it's pretty clear that many media outlets and the corporations which control them have a particular political perspective. As you know, the ACLU certainly supports a free press, including electronic media and the internet, which may actually change the face of politics as long as it remains a free and uncensored, accessible means of communication. Television is the most cost-intensive factor in any campaign. While there are many who believe that use of the airwaves, which belong to the American people and to the public, could and should be conditioned by requiring public and community service time, it's questionable whether you could impose a compelled speech element on those networks. The answer then, as I've said, might be to provide vouchers, to ask the media to open the debates to all candidates, not just those from the major political parties, and to reduce their rates. Such measures would also serve to level the playing field among candidates with great personal wealth and those without, among candidates of the two major parties and those affiliated with third parties. Now the rich and the incumbent have the advantage. According to data compiled by the Center for Repon Responsive Politics, in nearly two-thirds of all House district elections, an incumbent will raise and spend more funds than a challenger by a factor of 10 to 1. The Supreme Court has already held a candidate cannot be constrained in expenditures of his or her own money since the rationale of undue influence is removed. Incumbents have the advantage through media coverage, franking privileges, and staff. I know that staff can't participate on the taxpayer's dollar in campaigns, but it would be disingenuous to say that staff work that has done been done preliminary to campaigns does not play a major factor 
in hammering out positions in public relations and in various other means. Therefore, the ACLU would not support, for instance, denying the franking privilege to incumbents who are running for office, but would urge that the franking privilege be extended to all candidates to further level the playing field. The ACLU also fully, fully supports public disclosure. However, we have to be cautious that that public disclosure is not so onerous and burdensome that it creates a chilling effect on speech. Uh, again, we might be turning to the internet, which may be a, the way to, um, to have public disclosure that is not so onerous. It has to be some electronic means. Finally, the ACLU opposes any proposals for campaign finance reform which limit free speech and political expression, not because we do not believe that the system needs reform, but because we support the First Amendment. Thank you again for the opportunity to address one of the most critical issues of our time. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Adlers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> two, two of the witnesses have advocated public funding. Uh, I would, I'd be interested, uh, Ms. Ms. Essinger, on what does the, the, the uh, Arizona law say? I, I've heard about it from a distance. I'm just not that familiar. Can you give me a one-minute summary of the provisions of that law and how that relates to public funding? It requires candidates to, depending on the office, um, whether it's a, a legislative district or a statewide office, to get a number of qualifying contribu $5 contributions. Um, I believe it's 200 for the legislature. Not sure. Um, and after that, um, after you have qualified, then to receive the public funding. The funding, there's a, a set amount um, depending again on the office and it can be increased to three times that depending on if you have your if the candidate opposing you is um, has contributions um, greater than the public funding that you receive for example for the legislature if it was fifteen thousand dollars and your opponent was spending twenty five thousand then you would get an extra ten thousand dollars to match what your opponent so you developed a formula for that? Yes. And this passed in referendum? Yes, it did. By, and what, by what percentage? It passed, Congressman, um, a very small percentage. Very small. But it did pass. As I'm stuck at that, uh, I, I know I've tested that idea on my constituents a number of times, and they, uh, the majority, seem to say, I do not want my money going to you know, support campaigns of people I don't support. And uh, I, I'm also a little dismayed that both in Michigan, which has a public funding for the governor's race, and the U.S. government, which has public funding for a presidential race, in both cases uh, the contributions have been falling off, indicating less public interest in public funding, uh, voluntary public funding. So I, I don't know. Um, Maybe the citizens of Arizona are either more enlightened or different uh, from my particular area, but I'm, I'm surprised there'd be that much public support. I just wanted to comment, Ms. Eisenberg, on, on the franking privilege. Uh, you are aware, aren't you, that we have changed the law on the franking privilege. Uh, we pay postage out of our accounts in the Congress, just as any citizen does. In other words, we can't just sign our name on the letter and get free postage the way they used to. We now have to pay for it. In our case, we pay for it out of our office account, but we're not allowed to send mail out within 90 days before an election. That would, in any way, uh, other than to respond to letters people send us. Representative Ellers, I am aware of that. What we are suggesting, however, is that you can indeed use a franking privilege, as could other candidates who, who might be running against you, so that the the cost, what we're suggesting is that there are two sides of the formula in campaign finance reform. One is, is the revenue streams, which is now private contributions except in those four states that have public financing. But the other is the cost factor. And we recognize that if we're going to have public financing, then we're going to need to look at the other side, which is the cost side, and a way to reduce that for candidates who are running for office would be to offer a franking privilege to incumbents and 
non-incumbents who, who are in a race for office. So you, you oppose the McCain-Feingold bill, but you do advocate public funding of elections, correct? That is correct. We are strong advocates of public funding. And Ms. Uh, Essinger, do you also oppose the McCain-Feingold bill and, and advocate public funding? No. The or do you support the bill as well? The League of Women Voters um, of the United States and consequently the League in Arizona support McCain-Feingold. Uh, okay, I, I'm just a little surprised at a, at a disconnect there, but we don't have time to get into that here. Uh, I thank you both for your testimony. That's very, very enlightening, and it'll be an interesting experience to see how public financing works. I, uh, I, I have no idea. I know in, in some of my elections it would not have worked. Uh, it's, uh, I hate to use a word, but there is a kook factor here. Some people run just for the sake of having their name on the ballot and have no intention of, of running, and yet uh, they would probably be able to get Twenty or two hundred five-dollar contributions just in order to get public fund f funding. Uh, they are not really serious candidates. They don't show up for debates, etc. And I don't know how you deal with that or filter that out. May I comment? Just briefly, my time has just expired. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, the um, uh, initiative for public funding also provided that candidates must participate in debates in order to receive their funding. So uh, that's one of the issues that we, we have addressed. They can't get their money until they participate? The debates, you know, are scheduled and the candidates, unless, you know, there's a death in the family, for example, or, um, you know, some other legitimate reason, um, must participate in those debates in order to receive their funding. It's almost like paying children to go to school, isn't it? <laughs> Are you back to balance of my time? I don't think the lead would agree with that. Back up on that for a second before moving on to another member. How many debates do they have to come to to get the 15,000? Just one. One. One in the primary and then one in the, in the general. I'm assuming those candidates under public financing will be able to expend money for the political purposes of their furtherance of re-election, like everything else, like other, any other candidate can. Uh, are there any controls? Uh, you know, somebody shows up to one debate, gets $15,000. Maybe, in fact, you have 12, 15 people in a primary, and they get in there to be paid to be in there, and they uh, have, you know, campaign dinners and invite campaign guests and spend thousands of dollars show up to one debate. Has any of that been addressed? Fraud, basically, within the, the process because they're getting public dollars to do nothing except one hour of their time. I'm just, has that been addressed? No. I'm sure once it happens, it will be addressed. <laughs> yes, yes. And there'll be an outrage out here, and that closed vote <laughs> might be a, another closed vote. Well, um, I will say that there, there were certainly um, some things that did happen in the election um, that we were not prepared for, and, um, you know, adjusting accordingly. Um, I'll say um, wonderful things here, too, about the Citizens Clean Election Commission, which is overseeing this, um, was created by the Act and uh, is charged with implementing it. And I know they addressed some questions that nobody thought of. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Micah? <clears throat> thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the uh, concerns that I have is uh, lack of uh, transparency in this whole process. Uh, McCain Feingold, I guess the League has uh, endorsed it, but uh, to me it it just creates um, well, it creates a couple uh, problems. I don't think you have a really level playing field. Uh, transparency uh, is not truly addressed. One of the, don't you think one of the frustrations today is people don't know where the money's uh, coming from with soft money? Yes, I will. Um, I will agree with that. Um, if I may add, though, the league's viewpoint comes from that of you know the average citizen and the average voter, and the perception that many people have that you know it's money that buys everything here and. How do, you, how do you deal with uh, an individual? I mean, we had the New Jersey case. That basically, somebody spent $60 million and uh, 
Mr. Linder, Mr. Ellers, and I were elected with Mr. Franks. Uh, we hated to see him go down the tubes. Uh, great candidate, but I mean, absolutely no match for $60 million. McCain Feingold doesn't address that, does it? No, it does not. So, I mean, you, you, you have a huge gap there, and, um, and the, uh, the other thing that, I, and I'm not certain uh, of the, the, the detail of McCain Feingold is what's the situation with money uh, going to being diverted to state parties uh, or other entities and then being used? Does, is there a protection against that? In McCain Feingold? Yeah. I really don't think I can answer that. Does anybody, uh, any of the staff? Yes, uh, Mr. Michael, McCain Feingold does limit money uh, to state parties. Is that 60,000 or something? No, no, that, that's the, the Hagel legislation. Oh, Hagel, okay, but. 60,000. McCain Feingold shuts off all the money to the national and the state parties. Okay. His well, answer was McCain Feingold shuts off all the monies to the uh, state. But parties. again, every time we build, I mean, we try to pass these legislative solutions, and it may well uh, prohibit that. They find some other conduit in which to run the money through. One of the concerns was um, th that I have is again that there's under the Constitution and under the free speech clause. I think we'll still end up with uh, people being able and organizations being able to spend money for and against uh, candidates and issues. Uh, I think we'll end up with that. What I mean, uh, who's our best uh, advisor on this legally? Professor, what do you think? I think you're right. Uh, I think it's uh, very clear that uh, individuals are able to spend their own money to advocate their own political views. And uh, I don't and, think. And do you think that McCain Feingold? I mean, you've looked at. I, I don't know all the details of it, quite frankly. But, and I'm not an attorney. Uh, but can't there be other conduits uh, for uh, uh, for abusing the system, even after we've passed this? I believe that there can be. Um, let's see. Legally qualified. Is that uh, the ACLU? You said uh, you're going to give money to candidates that are legally qualified. Could you explain that? Representative Micah, uh, I believe that there is already incorporated in law how a party can qualify for its candidates to receive public funding. We certainly saw. Um, a fight within the Reform Party as to who was going to qualify for public funding, uh, whether or not the Green Party was going to garner the 5%. There, there was confusion either, even in that, and parties uh, create their own rules for, for qualifying. That's correct, but once a party is qualified to have its candidates receive public funding, that their nominee then becomes a candidate legally qualified to receive Congress? public funding. Excuse me? What about with Congress? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't what understand What about your with question. Congress? What is the definition of legally qualified candidate for Congress? I think it would be the same as a presidential candidate, if, if that's your question. Uh, it's a, as I understand it, it is a question of whether or not the nominee of a particular party would qualify through the party because the party has qualified as one which is entitled to, to some public funding. Well, uh, I was with you as far as your opposition to the current leg proposed legislation and also the uh, uh, imposition of uh, damage uh, done under the Constitution. and. Uh, and uh, First Amendment, uh, but I think we lost each other. I fell off the wagon when we got into the public uh, financing and getting into this question of who, uh, uh, who would receive public funding. Uh, I, I, 
again, I, I have great concern about that. Uh, and uh, one of the things we've observed late, recently and has already been alluded to by other members is that uh, the checkoff system and the, even in the presidential election now is showing fewer and fewer uh, individuals checking off. Uh, and somehow, I, in closing, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I become greatly concerned when my taxpayer dollars or checkoff money is being spent uh, to publicly finance uh, someone who I wouldn't want to give a nickel to in an election. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I think with respect to the falling off of the support for the checkoff, there's a chicken and an egg question. And I'm not sure that, that it is at, at all reasonable to assume that all of the people who do not check off a donation or a contribution to the political campaigns does so because of not wanting to support campaigns. I think it may well be the exact phenomenon that we are here, that, that is the reason we are here, and that is that people have lost faith in the political process and are therefore not willing to support it. Uh, as to your second point, if people in fact uh, have an option of not supporting the political process, would we then also have an option of not supporting further expenditures for, um, for military or for any other programs? We simply don't have in this country um, an option, except through the election process, uh, of electing representatives who will support the positions and, and budgetary items that we might support on how our taxes are spent. I don't see why the political, supporting the political process would be any different. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lender? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Aiden, you seem to say in your testimony that you've been involved for some time in grassroots organizations. They don't spend a lot of money, but they do have an influence on the process and that you probably wouldn't like anything done to diminish that opportunity. Is that fair to say? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Linder, uh, absolutely right. Uh, a lot of us grassroots folks, our strength is our people. Uh, there's basically no money at all involved. And you're not overwhelmed by the big money folks? Well, after many years as an activist uh, in Arizona, um, we've seen a lot of money come in, a lot of money go. Uh, a lot of times it's just simply the issue that decides the matter. Thank you. Professor Wardle, you you mentioned three good points out of the McCain-Feingold, the Beck decision would be codified. That only refers to people who are being charged a union due, although they're not union members. And isn't that an insignificant number of people? It is, and it's uh, not applicable in all states, if I understand the law correctly. Uh, that probably could be expanded, uh, I think, uh, appropriately. but. Uh, but I'm just, I was just uh, mentioning uh, parts of the bill that I thought uh, deserved uh, some favorable pat on the back. You also mentioned the uh, making, the taking of foreign money illegal and collecting money on federal property illegal. How do you make them more illegal than they were last year? Uh, you know, you make a good point, uh, Representative Linder, uh, and I'd like to uh, comment that with regard to public funding of campaigns. Uh, I have a concern conceptually about that for the very reason that you've given, that uh, we already have publicly funded presidential campaigns, and most of the campaign abuses that we've been very concerned about in recent years, in fact, occurred at that level. So public funding is not uh, a cure-all, certainly hasn't been effective yet, uh, perhaps exacerbates the problem. Uh, I'm not saying that there aren't ways that public funds could be used to make the electoral or campaigning process fairer. I believe that there could be some use of public funds appropriately. But my big concern is entanglement. Someone said it's where you get the money from. If, if what's corrupting about the money is, you know, you, you, where you're getting it from, where are we getting, where are the candidates getting it from if it's publicly funded? Uh, they, are, uh, they are beholden to an administration or an agency or the government, and that whole degree of entanglement creates severe First Amendment problems. We just don't want the government telling us uh, or regulating political speech. Is it your judgment that if the government does decide to pay for your speech, that down the road it would be a very small step to say what you can say? 
Uh, I think that's, the, uh, that's the, the slippery slope concern exactly, but I would have a concern even with them paying for your speech at the outset. The, the comment that uh, Ms. Essinger made about the corrupting influence of money or big money, we're talking about big money here uh, at the outset, not just down the slope, but at the outset has a, has a, a distorting effect on, on free speech in a republic uh, that depends on citizen, citizen initiative for its uh, for its integrity. Um, do you agree that it's an oversimplification that in Buckley v. Vallejo that money equals speech, or do you think that's precisely what the court said? Well, uh, I think that uh, slogan is partially accurate. I think what the court said is that individuals have the constitutional right to spend their own money uh, to purchase political speech or advertisement, but uh, money doesn't equal speech uh, I, I don't accept that. that that's, money equals speech is just a, a, an overly simplistic, perhaps. Ms. Eschinger, is it Eisinger? Eschinger. Eschinger. Uh, you won a 51 to 49 victory, correct? Yes. Uh, you weren't too anxious to say that. <laughs> how, much money did, how much money small. did you spend on that campaign? $900,000. Where did the money come from? Ooh, I, um, I really can't answer that right now. Didn't you report it? Yes. And you don't know where it came from? I was not the chair of the campaign. Yes, I mean, I, yes, I've seen them, but I cannot, I don't have that information with me. I'm, I'm really Isn't sorry. Isn't that George Soros paid for a good bit of it? I believe he was a contributor, but I... Isn't he a major contributor? I, I don't remember. I'm sorry. Um, your law that you passed proudly says that in getting your $5 donations from 200 people, you can't take a donation from anyone outside of the district to account for that. Yes. But you took a huge sum of money from people outside the state to yes. pass it. Yes. Don't you find that a little bit hypocritical? I find it realistic. Do you, what would you say if I told you that a significant part of George Soros's earnings come in international arbitrage and are made in foreign soil? I would say that I didn't know that. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Uh, Doolittle. Thank you. Uh, Professor Wardle, you've uh, testified that the system needs to be reformed. I just wonder if you could, in, in one sentence or in as brief a paragraph as possible, complete this sentence. Federal campaign finance needs to be reformed because? It doesn't work. The current law doesn't work uh, 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 well, number one. Number two, there are too many restrictions on uh, public funding. Number three, there's a tremendous amount of entanglement. Uh, Wait a minute, you mean on the fund by public funding, you mean on the donations from members of the public? You don't mean government funding, which is being advocated no, by I Ms. Essinger? No, mean government funding. It hasn't been working at the presidential campaign. Oh, you do level. mean government funding. Okay. Yes. Uh, I also believe that there are... Uh, um, well, those are three things, uh, and I'll also suggest a solution if you'd like, Mr. Doolittle. Okay, let's hear it. The first solution, I would say, is sunshine. Uh, okay, disclosure. Sun Sunshine is the best disinfectant, one of our justices once said. And I think uh, the problem is with concealed, secret, um, covert uh, kinds of stealth uh, uh, campaigns. Uh, Representative Micah referred to a campaign in which he didn't even know who was where the attacks were coming from. Um, I think that uh, is a, a, a grave concern, and it's in those those dark alleys that a lot of mischief is done. I think. So your solution is to what? Require uh, more disclosure of so-called unregulated money? I think the, there ought to be a disclosure uh, to the extent that it does not compromise or violate rights of privacy, and there is a line of cases that's very important there. Uh, Why would you offer that as a solution when there's a more direct, obvious solution? And what is that, sir? That would be uh, blowing out the limits entirely on hard money contributions, well, which I have given rise to this uh, push out into the unregulated field. 
Um, I do believe that uh, the uh, I support, and I I mentioned that in my written statement also, the raising of the campaign well, donations. Well, you said raising, but then you gave me another excuse why we should have more government regulation into the now into the so-called soft money area. Which do you prefer, more regulation by regulating soft money, imposing disclosure requirements, or raising the limits on hard money? I don't think that disclosure is more regulation. Uh, it's not more entanglement. It simply says, be honest and be open. Is it your belief that we have this uh, emphasis on soft money because of the low limits on hard money? I believe that that is one contributing factor. I don't believe that uh, you can eliminate uh, soft money, if you will, uh, even if you had no limits on hard money. I think that would still exist. And I don't think that it's wrong. I think soft money has a place. Soft money is a slogan, and now everyone's backing away from it because, it, because there have been, uh, ta it's, it's a tainted slogan. But what we're talking about, again, is an effort by individuals to express their point of view on political issues. And I don't think that there's anything uh, sh uh, shabby about that. Uh, it's when it's concealed, uh, when you've got misrepresentation. I think that uh, when you have fraud, then you've got a serious problem. Uh, Ms. Eisenberg, uh, let me ask you to complete the sentence. Federal campaign finance needs to be reformed because? Because it has created a situation where the advantage to those with personal wealth and with incumbency have access to the public beyond which any challenger or most challengers can achieve because people are concerned about the fact that uh, too much money is, is being raised and being spent, which has led to, um, shall we say, at least uh, mischief. And because those who are elected to office are not given the chance to turn their attention to governing because they are constantly running for office and that means the need to be out raising money, and we need to remedy those situations. Quick follow-up to, to, to you, uh, Ms. Eisenberg. Are you concerned about the uh, trends in this country as they may impact upon each citizen's First Amendment rights? Which trends are those? Trends under these uh, big government campaign finance reform schemes that will further restrict one's First Amendment rights. We are concerned about restrictions on, on First Amendment. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up with a, with a question, if I could. Uh, the issue, uh, and I think it, it ties in somewhat with McCain-Ferguson, uh, McCain, um, I'm sorry, uh, Feingold, in the sense of, you know, disclosure. This is about, in my opinion, about disclosure. I've had campaigns, especially in 1996, where hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent against me. To this day, I have no idea how much or exactly who did it. You, you'd see a name or something, but you didn't know who they were. And I think whether money was spent for or against me in advocacy ads, we ought to know who did it. Uh, and, they, and they hide behind, uh, you know, the, the fact that we don't have disclosure. So I'm for full disclosure. And then it's a free country, you can spend money you know, to keep us in or throw us out, but it's got to be full disclosure. But I still am, am, am bothered with the fact that you, in, in these proposals, you just shift and you make the balloon bubble on another end. In my opinion, these proposals could potentially take the political parties and push them down. Now, some people say that's good. But I think that the political parties have the ability to look at their candidates and support them when others wouldn't. And I'll give you an example. 21 years ago, I ran for the Ohio House of Representatives. In fact, I ran against the former chairman of this House Administration Committee at one time when he was in Washington, D.C., a very powerful congressman, well-liked by the constituency. He was in the Ohio House, and I ran against him. I was about uh, 25 or so when I filed. Really no hope uh, or chance to beat him. And within the political structure of the elected officials, even including Republicans, I couldn't get support. So you do the grassroots and things, but it was actually the National Political Party that said, maybe you have a chance. So if it was up to the old established network, even within my own party at that time 21 years ago, I wouldn't be sitting here. But the National Political Party said, you know, 
we'd like to have you in the party, whether you're conservative, moderate, liberal, we'd like to have you. But maybe I wasn't that right type of Republican for the existing structure 21 years ago. So having said that, if you take the two political parties in this bill and you push them down, then you still have the ability of a, a billionaire, for example, like Mr. Soros, who can come in and spend that money. So we've, quote, taken care of the problem with the political parties. We've taken care of the problem with the special interest groups. Uh, Mr. Aiden, I don't know if you want to call yourself a special interest, but you know, people would view you as a special interest. We took care of, of that. But in fact, you can fund you know, money into a program. In fact, the quote I see here, it was Steve, uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced this, Yazwiak of the Arizona Republic, uh, one day, 215,000 slams into the checkbook of people who want public funding of state elections in Arizona. Most of the money was from Washington, D.C. A few days later, $135,000 more slides into the coffers of Arizonans for clean elections from a group in Amherst, Massachusetts. Easterners haven't shown this much interest in Arizona since UFOs were spotted over Phoenix last year. So I guess the point is not to hit on, you know, my, on Arizona, my relatives are here from Phoenix, and we like your warm weather and your hospitality, but I, I just, this campaign issue, and with somebody who's a billionaire, if you have a millionaire involved in it, just goes back to my point, you know, don't you worry about the fact that we're, we're taking the political parties and, quote, taking care of them and other special interests, but we still are going to allow the wealthy, the really wealthy of this country, to just funnel in tons of personal money to do as they please and have it as their playground. You have an answer to that? No, I'm not worried. Um, and I think there's there's already been discussion, and I'm sure that the committee members um, are aware that um, you know Supreme Court decision on um, individual contributions to your own campaign. Um, and I am not worried about the political parties in Arizona. Not worried in the sense of that they will diminish in importance and influence. Um, certainly, the league is, you know, one of the league's um, positions is that uh, political parties become more active, that more people become involved in them. That's what we want to see, more competitive races, more candidates, more people involved in the process. One other question I have, and I'm asking you the question because if you support uh, you know, McCain, Feingold, or Shays, me, and either either version. Um, does it disturb you about, and the other witnesses have testified, does it disturb you with the fact that all of a sudden a piece of legislation says that uh, you're a group and you're out there and that X amount of days before the election, you, you, you can't say that, that Bob Ney or John Doolittle or Vern Ehlers voted this way. You, you literally can't. It would be illegal to actually use funds to say that. Does that bother you at all? I'm, I'm not aware of what provision in which piece of legislation. Well, there would be, a, if you using, if a group, which would be deemed a special interest, was utilizing funds, uh, for example, a corporate or a union, but they got funds donated to them, they can't use those funds to produce a, a brochure that tells how I voted for or against a, 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 a death penalty issue or, or whatever. You know, that, that's, those are actual provisions in the, uh, I forget the section of the bill, but those are actual provisions in the bill. That, now that, that you know that's in there, what do you feel about that? I think that um, this is a free speech question and, and regulation um, and equating the, the speech with, with money. And um, the League's position certainly is that um, speech can be regulated to some extent and money can be regulated to some extent. Um, do you think, okay, okay, but do you think, let me give you two examples. Um, a uh, pro-choice group would be uh, prohibited uh, from uh, spending money if, in fact, they had it, uh, corporate donations that were, were given would be prohibited from actually producing a brochure to tell where a member of Congress would stand on an issue. But um, if somebody wanted, as I understand, and if our attorneys can correct me, if, 
You, if I singularly, if I was a multimillionaire, could spend whatever unlimited amount of dollars I want to, to talk about that issue. Do you think that would be fair under the bill? I mean, one is a regulated speech because we don't think that's the right type of contribution going into that group, the pro-choice group, but because a multimillionaire can open their checkbook up, that's an okay person to put out the, the pamphlet on the issue. I mean, what do you think about that? I think I'll go back to, um, to where the league is coming from here and the effect of large amounts of money on, um, on citizens. And that we hear, I, I appreciate um, the comment earlier about the, about the amount of money spent on advertising for um, candidates for the U.S. Congress versus how much on, on painkillers. But that's not the perception of the public. We, you know, we don't go around comparing how much money somebody spent advertising our cereal this morning um, that we had this morning you know, versus how much money you're spending on your campaign. The, league, the, the league's bottom line here is more involvement of people in the political process. And one of the things we would like to see is this, at least the perception of big amounts of money that have a deterring effect on citizens. Mr. Linden. Would you yield, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Are you prepared to suggest fundamental reform of our campaign laws because of erroneous perceptions? No. Isn't that what you just said? No. You said the, you talked about the aspirants. We, we spend more right. on yogurt than we spend on politics. Yes, and I, I, I appreciate that. And you said, but that's not the perception of the public. No. Well, should we fix the laws or give the public an honest perception? Yeah, I will tell you, it's the, very same, it's the very same editors and editorialists on broadcast television that are misleading the public with the perception who want limits put on political speech. It's the very same people. And I think you're at the wrong table. You ought to be down at the Republic talking to them about informing your neighbors correctly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Doolittle. Uh, I was troubled by that uh, comment as well. And, you know, we get accused of, and sometimes rightfully so, for people in public office of uh, running around with their stupid polls trying to respond to the public's perception. It's the blind leading the blind many times. You know, we're polling to figure out what the public thinks, and the public doesn't know what it thinks from day to day. It has a, has a, has a change of opinion on a whim, and so we're trying to follow that. I've never operated that way, and I, I didn't think the league did. The, um, you know, wh one of the comments that I made um, in my testimony was the over $200 million, I believe, that each of the political parties nationally um, raised last year. Well, that was probably necessary you know, money from, from someone's perspective. But I look at that and, you know, I'm not thinking about advertising yogurt or pain relievers or anything else, and I say, why? But doesn't the league t pride itself on being knowledgeable of the facts and yes. trying to improve our government according to what the facts actually are? Yes. Well, that was my understanding. Yes. And here the facts clearly are that you know, we always hear repeated by the big government reformers the mantra that campaign costs are skyrocketing, implying that they're exceeding what other general costs exceed. In fact, that's not true. In fact, campaign, the cost of campaigning lag behind most other general areas of advertising. Now, that is an established fact, and uh, I'll be happy to document that for the record. But it is a fact. And so if we can stipulate for the moment that that's a fact, then we would have to reject the assertion that campaign costs are skyrocketing because the implication of that assertion is false. Is it not? I don't know. I would need to um, compare the cost of campaigns versus campaigns rather than the cost of campaigns versus aspirin. Advertising for well, aspirin. All right, aspirin's one example, yogurt's another example, just advertising in general. I think we all understand the bulk of campaigning is about communicating your ideas somehow to the public. Yes. 
I mean, that's, that's where the vast amount of, of campaign expenses go. The other amount goes to paying lawyers and accountants to comply with all the horrendous government regulation we already have, which the proposals you advocate will make even worse. So, but setting that aside for a minute, just accept the stipulation, I, and I will, I will uh, if you, I mean, I think you did accept it, but I said at the beginning, let's assume that this is a fact, which is that other costs, other general advertising costs are rising faster than campaign costs. If we accept that fact, then why would we build our support for campaign reform upon a wholly false premise, which is, that the campaign costs are rising faster than the other general advertising costs. Mr. Chairman, might I respond to that? I think you're setting up a completely false dichotomy by comparing advertising in the private sector to expenses for political campaigns in which there is a political arena. I don't think that we're talking about suggesting to advertisers or anybody is, is pretending to suggest to advertisers that the government is going to tell them how to spend their dollars. They have to account to their shareholders for that. But, but why, in the public, excuse me, may I, may, I, may I complete? When we are comparing general advertising costs to campaign costs. We are not comparing, Jeff. That is the false dichotomy. I the only, the the only similarity may be advertising. To get an understanding of what this assertion is, because the fact of the matter is the assertion doesn't stand the test of truth. Campaign costs are not skyrocketing in relationship to other advertising costs. I have not heard that assertion except here. And it, it's that me. assertion is made by big government campaign reformers every single day in advocating for their big government campaign reform. It, it, if I may complete my thought, Mr. Chair. Yes, please. I think the only similarity between political campaign financing and advertising aspirins is that they both relate to headaches. <laughs> well, I'm the one short of that. Time, and I'm going to assert to you that it's the chairman's time and I'm on his time, but I still have the time. I want to say this. We are talking about advertising costs. Now, what is inappropriate about that? What is, what is uh, in any way inappropriate to challenge the assertion, which is one of the fundamental premises of Shays Meehan and McCain-Feingold, that the skyrocketing costs of campaigns are what justify this degree of regulation. I've just told you, and I think you know it, that they are not skyrocketing in relation to other advertising costs. That seems to me very relevant. I don't understand why you say it isn't relevant. The premise is not to compare what it costs private advertisers to spend money that they raise and that they pass on the expenses for which to the consumer. Well, the we campaigns have to pay whatever the market rate is of advertising. We are talking about what is fundamentally a political and public process, and therein lies the difference. There's I no, think it is. Not we are not talking. It's a distinction at all. It doesn't matter which is going more or less. It what certainly matters, does matter. What matters that is that there the bulk is of campaigns are the advertising costs. You sit there and tell me it doesn't matter. It certainly matters. The I'm not talking about public funding or I mean government funding of campaigns. I'm saying when Doolittle for Congress goes to place an ad in the newspaper or to buy TV time or radio time, we have to pay whatever the market rate is. The issue, Senator Doolittle, is that campaigns cost you too you. much. Well, not I mean, excuse me. I'm sorry, from our point of view. Doolittle, excuse me. Um, the issue is that campaigns cost too much money, not by comparison, to anything. Well, that, are you sitting here telling me that in the absolute sense you're going to tell me what is too much money? Isn't too much money always in a comparative sense? How can you sit there and declare that it's too much money is an absolute? That's absurd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the interest of, of comedy, comedy also, I'll make sure everybody gets a, uh, gets a free aspirin after this hearing. And, <laughs> it'll be off me, not the taxpayers. Uh, Mr. Ehlers? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thought perhaps it was time for the good cop to speak. Uh, I, I, I just, first of all, I want to thank you for your testimony. I mean, it's clear to me you were, you were for 
very interested, very sincere, well-meaning citizens uh, trying to deal with the, what is perceived to be a major problem and may be a major problem. I, I just want to make uh, refer back to something I said during my opening statement. What really counts is the integrity of the candidate, and that's what people, the citizens should be looking at because I don't care what campaign finance laws we have in place. They can be evaded or manipulated in some way by someone who is, does not have integrity. Public funding, for example, and I, I'm not particularly op opposed to it, except I, I don't think it's very workable. But, but I, just sitting here, I've thought of several ways in which I could very easily subvert public funding to my own personal purposes. And that's true of, and so that's not going to be the answer either. What we have to educate the public on is looking at the candidates, looking at their integrity, looking at the issues, and making their judgment on that basis, not just on 30-second TV ads. I, uh, the only, the only, in my mind, the only case that you might possibly make for public funding is to provide an equal playing ground when you have a multimillionaire who spends millions of his own money, and then you allow the opponent to have equal amounts of public funding to co counteract personal funding. Uh, you know, you're shaking your head. I, I, I think that's a, a more legitimate basis than many others. I'm not advocating. I'm just saying then at least you're leveling the playing ground. But uh, be very careful of what you wish for in, in this game because uh, almost every proposal I've seen has been subverted, including our current campaign laws, which were written after Watergate to clean things up. And everyone says, oh, this is wonderful. We will now have everything taken care of. And we didn't anticipate uh, renting out Lincoln bedrooms and things like that. Uh, it, uh, as I say, it comes down to a matter of integrity, and let's remember that. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You, Mr. Leggett. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, first I have a little comment and then a question, I think, for uh, the professor. I was very dismayed, as some others expressed, about hearing the League say that they were dealing with the perception. I, I, I've always had the greatest respect for the League of Women Voters as really concentrating on education and getting into, into depth uh, on issues. And in my community and state, it's always been a, one of the best to, uh, uh, to really, uh, again, hone in on problems. And uh, it is unfortunate that, uh, that, uh, that they would deal with perception. And I think that's going to, and a solution that deals with uh, dealing with perception is going to be even more frustrating to the public. I'm even more dismayed to hear the League testify that the solution that deals with perception that they're pushing uh, will not solve the problem, uh, which we've heard testimony here to for uh, today. Uh, that only frustrates people, I think, even more and will make them even more dismayed with the process. We've had one experience with public funding uh, at the federal level, and that's been an unmitigated disaster, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and the federal level, as Professor Waddle testified, uh, most of the abuses have come from the presidential uh, campaign uh, that people are frustrated with, not knowing where the money came from or taking money from these sources and using that uh, the public money that they've checked off. Uh, the people aren't dumb. They're not checking off because they know people uh, abuse that. So, and that, that, what's being proposed by ACLU is what they've tried here in... Uh, in Arizona, I'm even more dismayed to hear that in Arizona that they distorted and the League participated in it, the very uh, sacred process we have, which is supposedly a representative form of government, rather than passing a law that was passed uh, through the legislative process. It was done in the same distortive manner that Mr. Linder disclosed with Soros. Uh, and the League can't even testify today as to uh, who gave the money which distorted the process, which gave a quick fix solution, which doesn't solve the problem even here in Arizona. So uh, while I was pleased to come here, Mr. Chairman, I'm dismayed uh, with what I've heard 
and the solutions that have been offered and then the experience we've seen. Finally, the question is, I, I become a stronger advocate of full disclosure, uh, Professor. The question I have is we know we can't put limits on uh, free speech or individual contributions, and Mr. Eller's idea, I think, is a is interesting if we're ever going to give money any place it should be to to have someone uh, say have a, sh a fair shot who's uh, against someone who has a unlimited means because we're not going to be able to control that. But in full disclosure, is there some constitutional or some limit that would be thrown out requiring groups or individuals to disclose should they uh, provide uh, funds, we'll say a substantial amount, we'll, we'll, we'd set some amount uh, to disclose those amounts and um, would, would, is there some something that would, that uh, legally or constitutionally that would prohibit uh, re that requirement for full disclosure? Uh, the answer, uh, uh, for participation in a federal election. I believe the answer to that, uh, like many questions, is that the, uh, the it depends on the details. The devil is in the details. How it's worded, uh, there is. Could, could could we word something that would be constitutional, that would require both individuals and groups? Uh, we'll say if they put in more than five thousand dollars or some amount uh, that would be justified that they must, if they're going to support, oppose a candidate, an issue in a federal election, uh, they must disclose in a timely fashion. I believe that that is sustainable. Uh, there is a principle that uh, the right of individuals to associate cannot be, uh, is, is a constitutional right that can't be, um, that can't be uh, infringed uh, the NAACP case in which a southern state was trying to force disclosure of members of the NAACP at a time that that was a very uh, controversial organization in that community and would have subjected its members to tremendous uh, pressure, probably harassment. So uh, the court protects the rights of association, but what we're talking about here is not requiring disclosure of members who associate. What you've suggested is a kind of a scheme that requires disclosure of action that participates in a public election. That's different than belonging and membership, and I believe that kind of disclosure could be constitutionally framed, has been constitutionally, and should be constitutionally uh, 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 supported. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, yes. May I comment on yes. uh, earlier comments yes. about the link? Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Mm -hmm. um, my comments on perception of the public um, as to big money in campaigns was meant as just one component of why people do not participate in the political process. Um, if, for example, um, I'm thinking about running for office, and what I hear is that, you know, another candidate got all this money from this industry and all this money from somebody else, and it cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's going to deter me, that kind of information. Um, I also want to suggest that I'm sorry, it's going to deter me from, from wanting to participate from, as, as a candidate. Um, if um, and it's going to deter me as a voter somewhat, too. Um, I also want to point out that I don't think that any I, – I don't want to speak for all the other panelists, just myself, but I don't think that we have um, proposed today a definitive answer to campaign finance reform or camp financing of campaigns. I think it's an evolving process. As, as you mentioned earlier, back in um, the 70s, we thought that we had the answer. We didn't have the answer. Uh, Mr. Mike, I want to know if you're withdrawing your support for McCain Feingold. <laughs> no. No. Mr. Mike, no. That's the answer. Uh, let me just just say I appreciate your comments and appreciate your you know answers to things. And I, and I think you made a point that I agree with. There is there is not a definitive answer, and today does not give that. But what today offers is, is exchange of ideas, uh, exchange of debate. And uh, it, this is out live through the internet, 
people can see this, start to think about it all across the United States, and I think that's great. I, I just wanted to follow up with one thing, though, and just give you a scenario, and I, and I guess I won't even a, I won't ask you to answer, but I want to give you a scenario. If you have a candidate, and that's John Smith, and John Smith happens to be, let's say, anti-choice, and whether you're pro-choice or, you know, right to life, um, you should want both groups to be able to, in a free country, argue about this, whether you're pro-choice or you're right to life. But let's say candidate John Smith is anti-choice, and a pro-choice group forms together of 700 people, and they've taken in some money, and they have some donations and some union money or corporate money was given. 60 days before the election under McCain-Feingold, that group of five to 600 people cannot purchase an ad, uh, cannot purchase a radio ad, but one person worth $7 million can make a statement against John Smith uh, that John Smith's not good because he's anti-choice or John Smith's good because he's anti-choice. So you have the voice of, you know, 600 on the right hand stopped because we deem their money to be different. But one human being can override 600 and do whatever they please. And I, I just want to just throw that out there because that is a scenario that could occur under the under the several piece of legislation, but under the McCain-Feingold. And that personally bothers me because we're making a judgment call on whose money is is what, and I think that y you have to go after money's money, money in the system. And I'll also end with telling you that in the state of Ohio, if you run as a state candidate, you have to fill out a form within a certain period of time. If you're going to spend over $25,000 of your money, you have to tell that. If, in fact, you are going to do that, the limits come off on your opponent. They can spend whatever they want to match your money because you are an individual wealthy person. If, in fact, you do not fill out that form and you do spend over $25,000 of your money, you can be actually taken out of office after the election because you violated that, that, that contract uh, in running. That levels a playing field. But if we don't do something to level playing field, I'm telling you, you think that politics now is, is influenced and it is really going to be, you know, contained. And, and the other thing is this, too, and I've watched it change over 20, 21 years. I feel bad, you know, for the average human being, Democrat, Republican, Independent, Libertarian, whatever, that wants to get in politics today. You know, we, none of our parents, none of our mothers gave birth to us in the rotunda of the Capitol. We weren't, uh, you know, raised in the capital. We came from all across this country in different walks of life. But overregulation has made it almost impossible for the average. I came from, a, a, from as a state senator to run, so I knew the system, and and you had, you know, help and experience. The average person, honestly, can probably get themselves almost thrown in jail today. Uh, you have to have accounts and lawyers and all these things. So I think we've made it very, very difficult for the average person to really, you got to be on the inside track of this, and I, I, that's what I worry about. Thank you. Yeah. Just, an, just another observation on the point you're making. The, yes, the millionaire could, of course, spend $7 million for himself or any amount of money for himself, but there's another oddity under the present law, and it would be even worse under any of these big government campaign reform uh, proposals, and that is you know, under present law, corporations can't give money at all to uh, candidates. However, the Arizona Republic can uh, write an editorial attacking some candidate for his viewpoint or supporting some candidate for his viewpoint, and that's perfectly acceptable, uh, both within the present law and within the, the laws that's proposed to be modified by these two bills. And I guess we have to ask, why is that? an acceptable outcome. Why, why, does, why do corporations that own media, why are they given some special preference under the law that no one else enjoys except the wealthy for themselves? I was listening to Ms. Eskinger's comment about the, you know, the perception that you'd be discouraged if some group gave a bunch of money to somebody. You know what? That's really not discouraging because you can go to some other group and get them to give a bunch of money to you. Under the law that we live under, though, and under the laws that's going to be modified by these two big government campaign regulation schemes, that will be even harder to do. 
People ask me all the time, John, when are you going to run for Senate? I say never, unless I'm appointed. Why? It's got to be a celebrity in California. Arnold Schwarzenegger's talking about running for governor. If of our state right now, we have many millionaires who've attempted to run. You know why? I can't take the time to go and, and raise money in increments of $1,000, because we need about $28 million or so to run a credible race for Senate in California. So what are we left with? We're left with millionaires, and we're left with celebrities. That's what we're left with. There's a few exceptions still, I'm happy to note. But this is where we're heading over time if we don't properly deal with the issues confronting us. If we just blithely go down the road and have more and more regulation, we're going to drive the average person out of public office. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think you're passionate enough we can get you a movie contract and then run you for the Senate someday out there. <laughs> with that, uh, we'll conclude this film. I really want to thank all four of you for your time spent here. We really do deeply appreciate it as uh, House Administration Committee. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to the next panel. It's good. And we're on time. How do we? Is there a way to go downstairs and get? Mr. Chairman, you know how Americans regard politicians today with suspicion. That is a condition that we must repair by changing the underlying campaign finance system. It cannot be pleasant to have to raise so much money. It cannot be satisfying to have your constituents and friends think that if you from time to time vote in favor of the coal industry's interests, Mr. Chairman, that there is any connection between those votes and the fact that you are the House of Representatives' largest recipient of coal industry dollars. It cannot be pleasant for members of the House Transportation Committee, such as Mr. Micah and Eilers, to worry that they will be held in suspicion because their highest contributions come from the transportation industry. Only a thorough overhaul of the system will allow Congress true ethical freedom and the ability to regain the public's full trust. Mr. McCain's bill is at least a beginning. For those of us who have learned to care about this issue uh, at a time when 90-year-old Doris Granny D. Haddock walked through Arizona on her way to Washington, we are glad to know that she will be walking around the U.S. Capitol in the days ahead while the Senate debates Mr. McCain's bill. She says that if each step of her walk represents $1,000 of special interest soft money in the last election, she will have to walk 257 miles around the Capitol to represent all that cash. You did not have to come here because we in Arizona have added our voice to her and she has walked it, walked that message to you over 3,200 miles at no taxpayer expense. That is free speech. And I hope you are listening because Granny D speaks for me and for millions of Americans. Thank you. I just want, I just want to, uh, please, we've asked either direction, no response of, of uh, clapping. Um, let me just address something for a second. I just reiterate here. Today. We uh, can choose to go to different parts of the United States, and we don't come here today to have anybody declare constitutionality or not, uh, but this is a hearing. Uh, the other thing about contributions, which you make a point of, I'm, I'm quite proud and would assume that in order to save jobs for the United Mine Workers Union of America, that they are in fact going to support me in the coal industry versus trying to put me out because they're able to feed their families due to my result of helping them. So I don't view that as a conflict of interest, which you raised. I will tell you, however, uh, McCain-Feingold does not eliminate PAC money. So therefore, the perception, if McCain-Feingold were passed today, of members of Congress receiving contributions, whether it's us or Senator McCain or whoever it is, or Senator Feingold or Representative Shays or me and they're still going to receive, well, Representative Shays actually doesn't take back money, but they're still going to receive 
those contributions, those perceptions within people's minds are still going to be out there. So I just wanted to make a point of that. Uh, I agree with the, you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, well, I just want to make a point of that because as you relate that to this committee of contributions, what you support, in fact, doesn't eliminate contributions. With that, we'll move on to the next witness. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Joe Yuhas. I'm the executive director of the Arizona Restaurant Association, and I want to uh, join in welcoming you to Arizona, and thank you for uh, conducting today's hearing. Our association represents one of the largest industries in Arizona, with nearly 8,000 establishments employing over 150,000 workers. The Arizona restaurant industry accounts for over 8 percent of the state's economy. The restaurant industry is represented in every town and hamlet in the country. We are the largest private sector employer in the nation, and in fact, outside of government, we are the largest employer in the nation. We are typically the first place of employment for your children or those seeking to re-enter the workforce. We are an industry of opportunity for women who fill six out of ten of our positions, while African Americans and Hispanics account for 12 and 17 percent of our management positions, respectfully. In fact, the number of women and minority-owned restaurants in the United States has increased at a double-digit rate in each of the past several years. We are the heart of the nation's philanthropic and community service efforts, and we are a small business, with seven out of ten restaurants employing less than 20 people. There may be those who are quick to paint us as just another special interest group. But, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I would suggest that the restaurant industry is America. So given the investment our members make in their business and in the community, with the number of employees who rely on our, on our industry for their livelihoods, with the countless public agencies that regulate our trade, and with the tax revenue we contribute at all levels of government, it stands to reason that those in the restaurant industry have a more than passing interest in the public policymaking process. As executive director of the Arizona Restaurant Association, I have had the first-hand experience dealing with both federal and state campaign finance laws. In addition to lobbying on issues of importance to the industry, we provide members with support on legal and regulatory compliance and sponsor educational forums. Based on my experience, I have three major concerns with S-27 and H.R. 380. First, these bills do not seriously address the reality that hard money contribution limits in place since the reforms of the mid-70s have now deteriorated as, as a result of 30 years of inflation. Candidates spend so much time raising money today, in part because the high cost of reaching the voters can only be met through antiquated contribution limits. I believe that the explosion of soft money in recent years is a direct reflection of the fact that the hard money component of our campaign finance system is wholly outdated. Raising hard limits for individuals and PACs in a commensurate manner would help alleviate those pressures and put campaign money back in the hands of candidates. Second, the legislation, coordination, and issue advocacy provisions would further constrict the free flow of information between lawmakers and those affected by the decisions in the business and, and commu labor communities as well as the public. They unfairly target corporations and labor unions that have had a chilling – that would have a chilling effect on the discussions of public policy issues critical to our nation's economy. No matter how hard they deny, the reform community wants to restrict the speech of some – of some to the benefit of incumbent office holders. Finally, the legislation would devastate the political parties and leave wealthy contributors and the press in control of the political discourse in America. Both bills severely hamstring state political parties with regulatory red tape and eliminates a major source of funding for important party building activities at the state and federal level. With political parties out of the way, wealthy individuals will, would continue to give millions of dollars through nonprofits to advance their philosophies at a level of sophistication akin to the political parties themselves, effectively destroying a two-party system that has served our nation well for generations. That is essentially what is taking place here in Arizona. Our voter-enacted public finance law was a rush to judgment without the benefit of a thorough public debate. Aside from the argument that my tax dollars are being used to finance the campaigns of individuals whom I don't agree with, our members and their employees cannot even contribute to the candidate of their choice without triggering an appropriation of public funds of a like amount to their opponents, including fringe party candidates. Financing of campaign in Arizona is still in its infancy, but I predict we will see a continued deterioration of the two-party system at an even more rapid pace here in Arizona. And as we examine the instability of coalition governments around the world, I fear for the ability of Arizona lawmakers to govern effectively in the future. And let me say, uh, in regards to Representative Linder's comments earlier, it is true that the vast majority of the funding for the ballot initiative that enacted public financing in Arizona came from out of state. In fact, you could say 
that the election process now in Arizona was affected by its own um, foreign contributions, and not simply one election, but in fact every election now that is to follow. These approaches to campaign finance are not the only option before Congress. I know that other lawmake lawmakers are wrestling with this issue and deserve recognition for their bipartisan efforts, including our Senator McCain, who frankly has raised the public debate on this, and if he has not uh, initiated it, certainly has contributed to it and needs to be commended for that. But as the Senate and the House debates approach, I would encourage the media and the public to take a closer look at all options before reaching judgment. Our two-party system of government and the stability that comes with it deserves careful, deliberate analysis of our options, not an artificial rush to judgment. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Elliott, good to have you here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I have submitted a statement for the record that I would like to summarize for you. I'm appearing today to express my opinions on what has been called campaign finance reform. And I've developed these opinions after serving 18 years on the Federal Election Commission, two years as vice president of a campaign management firm, and 17 years as an executive of a large political action committee. My opinions are based on my firm commitment to the First Amendment and a profound respect for the Supreme Court. I believe the Supreme Court meant what it said in Buckley versus Vallejo. With that preface, I would like to make three quick points and then offer two suggestions. First, I do not believe that there is a crisis in soft money. I do believe that there is a crisis in hard money in campaign finance. The current hard dollar contribution limits were set 26 years ago when a first class postage stamp cost 10 cents. Today it costs 34 cents. Inflation has risen over 340% in this time. But the market basket of political goods, printing, postage, polling, and television has increased even more. Low limits force candidates to spend more time raising money than talking to voters. Tight hard dollars mean that there is no place for volunteers since campaigns need technical expertise and speed. Hard dollar limits has made grassroots campaigning unaffordable and obsolete. Help from party committees is more necessary than it ever has been. Second, political parties only use soft money for the things that do not have to be paid for with hard dollars, very essential things that make democracy possible. Critics lose sight of the fact that the national party committees report all of their soft money activity to the Federal Election Commission. Everyone can see where it comes from. If soft money is banned or limited, it is my opinion it will still be spent, but in backdoor, underground ways that will never be reported. No one will be able to follow the money. The current proposals that I have read would not pass constitutional muster, in my opinion. Any law that undermines reporting and disclosure is contrary to the few successes in our present system. Only with disclosure can we find violations such as contributions by foreign nationals. If it weren't for party contributions, some money would flow into unexpected independent expenditures. On Monday of this week, David Broder uh, in the Arizona Republic wrote, most senators worry more about facing a barrage of these kind of unexpected ads than they do about uh, their party collecting soft money. Contributions to parties are also desirable since party committees do not have legislative policies, nor do they lobby Congress. Instead, parties work with candidates not office holders. They simply do not, I simply do not believe that contributions to party committees will or have corrupted our government. And third, corporations, labor unions, and issue groups avoid trouble under the existing law by omitting express advocacy 
in their advertisements. Some reform proposals try to regulate this speech by replacing express advocacy standard with one called electioneering. The FEC has been down that road and it has been rejected by the courts. I urge the committee to read those cases before enacting any new law. Under no circumstances would I recommend the FEC become the speech police. The Federal Election Campaign Act when the 74 amendments went into effect was well balanced, but now it's outdated. Some reform ideas pick at one point and pick at another point, and they're, if they are enacted, they're gonna throw off the balance of the act. It, there will be losers and there'll be winners, but the electorate will not be one of the winners. I'd like to close with two suggestions. One, Congress should address the hard dollar crisis by increasing contribution limits, at least with inflation. It may be a constitutional way to reduce the party committee's soft dollar fundraising. And second, Congress should consider expanding which television and radio advertisement buys must be put in the station's politic, uh, public file. This file is open to the public and shows the size of the buy, its sponsor, and its cost. Currently, only a candidate's ad are placed in the public file. If the requirement was expanded to include ads that mention a candidate and issue ads, the public would have more information about the source and cost of these third-party ads without having to create a new government program. Requiring such reports to the federal government would be unenforceable. As you imagine, I have strong views on many aspects of campaign finance legislation that I would be glad to share with you at the appropriate time. For today, thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. I would like to also recognize the following individuals who have submitted testimony to the committee today. We appreciate your interest. John uh, Jacobsik. Uh, Doug Haynes, Lila Schwartz, David McKay, Carol Crockett, and uh, Chuck Doggs. Mr. Avers? Uh, I have a motion that the minority is willing to uh, entertain it that the record be, I uh, ask unanimous consent that the record be open for at least uh, seven days to accept additional uh, statements, uh, information from interested parties to be made part of the official record of this hearing. Mr. Michael, without objection, moves that the record be left open for seven days for any interested individuals, either to add additions or people from the audience or citizens to add additions uh, to testimony as the record. Hearing no objection, motion is granted. Mr. Ehlers? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate the testimony from all of you, and I, I do have to say, uh, Ms. Elliott, I, I agree that we should adjust campaign finance limits to inflation. It should have been done originally, and the longer we wait, the harder it is. We made a serious effort several years ago, and the outcry from various groups uh, scared the Congress, and, and we're still back where we were 26 years ago. At the same time, I do have to say to two other panelists, I'm very nervous about not having any limits at all, um, because uh, I, I, I just do not think that would be healthy. I think candidates should have to go out and solicit can, contributions from everyone, not just major donors. Uh, getting into some specific questions, um, yeah, Ms. Elliott, you raised uh, what I think is an important point, although you didn't really um, emphasize it at all, and it hasn't come out in the discussion today, and that is the fate of political parties in America. I am very concerned about their future existence. As you know, political parties used to be very, very important. They literally picked all the candidates, uh, either in smoke-filled rooms or through conventions of party faithful. Uh, that is no longer true. Almost all candidates are now picked by the public through primary elections. In addition, the, the advent of television and the willingness of people to contribute enough money so candidates can advertise has further weakened the parties. I never won an election, with a, uh, my first election, with the support of the party. 
uh, they always supported my opponents. Uh, and, and not an official support, but the leaders of the party always supported uh, my opponents. Yeah, I didn't take that personally. I knew I was going to win anyway, and I did win, uh, to indicate they didn't have good judgment. But I still think it's very important for the parties to continue, and I work very hard with my local party. What is often not recognized is that parties are in the danger of extinction. Their only source of funds at this point, by and large, is the soft money. They get some, mem some membership contributions, but the soft money allows the parties to get out their message. Now, maybe uh, they are not getting it out appropriately. Maybe we have to be concerned about how they get it out. But I, I, we should not lose that in this whole discussion and argument. Uh, there's a real concern among many people that if McCain finally <coughs> passes or some other bill that imposes the limits that does, uh, that may hurt the parties far more than it will hurt any of us candidates. Having said that, uh, Mr. Burke, a few questions. Uh, one thing, I, I don't remember when Common Cause was founded initially. Do you remember? Uh, well, I think 1972 is probably a good date. 72, that's, that's what I was about to guess. I knew it had to be before I got elected, which is for the first time, which is 74. I remember when it started. I have the highest regard for John Gardner. He's a marvelous man. I've read, read his books. And uh, the first solicitation I got from Common Cause, I, I joined. I'm a charter member. I think it was a great idea. I'm still a member. I've never given up my membership. But I do have to say, when I get the mailings today, I open them and I shudder because they're, they're filled with more falsehoods than I've seen, seen in mo most political campaigns. They use words which ha I haven't really heard mentioned here today and basically accusing all office holders of corruption because they accept campaign contributions from people whose issues are before them. Well, I have to tell you, uh, everyone in America today belongs to interest groups, at least one and generally more. I just gave a speech to a group this past week, and one, during the question period, one man got up and railed about the special interest groups. When are you going to control the special interest groups, et cetera, et cetera? And so after he sat down, I said, well, let, let me ask a question. Uh, how many individuals here are a member of AARP? And about 75% of the hands went up, including the person who asked me that question. So I informed him he was a member of the biggest interest group we have in the United States. And the point is, we have always had interest groups. We always will have interest groups. They are good. They represent the point of view of the people who are their members. Common cause is an interest group. And I think it's uh, accusing elected officials of being corrupt, and that campaign money corrupts the system as common cause has has done for several years, and I think deliberately to raise more money, I think really skews it. And, and it hurts me because I was, I'm an ardent supporter of what Common Cause tried to do. I'm really very angry at what they are doing today. They are spreading a lot of false information and, and misimpressions. I'm not accusing you, you no longer are affiliated with them, but I just had to get that out because I think it really is very misleading to the American public. On the one point that you did say, I, I do want to comment. Uh, you mentioned that um, we accept campaign contributions from entities, whether it's a coal industry or something, that we then have to vote upon. Uh, any of us are free at any time to refuse campaign contributions, and I have done that. I, uh, I never accept them from the National Rifle Association or the Tobacco Association. Those are very contentious areas, and no matter how I voted, people would think I was influenced. I, uh, I've also had constituents who have sent me a campaign contribution and then wrote me a letter uh, a year later criticizing me for a vote and said, I voted for, I, I supported you, I sent you $50, and now you vote against me. And I, in every case that happens, I just write them a check and send it right back and say, I'm sorry you thought you were buying my vote. You weren't, but I want you to feel better about it. Here's your money back. Uh, Month contributions do not influence votes uh, to any great extent. Uh, I don't know of any extent that, uh, you know, I don't know. It's bribery if we would succumb to that. It's, out, it's illegal. And I, my colleagues just don't do it. Now, if you want to criticize a system, criticize not for that, but because uh, campaign contributions may elect individuals who have a particular point of view. 
But don't think that members of Congress are voting a certain way because someone gave them a, a contribution. That's simply not true. And I wanted to get that on the record as part of enlightening this whole issue. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I should also note. I should also note the interest of free speech. You were the only panelist given double the time to speak today on your opening statement. Go ahead. Oh, I'm very Yes, sir. That's no problem. All right. Well, on behalf of my former employer, Common Cause, let me make one distinction in, in that they do not give funds to candidates. Uh, they are an issue-oriented group uh, that tries to raise issues. Um, there is a distinction to be made there, um, and, and I think a, a, an important one. And I, I recognize that. Yes. I'm not that they do. Yes. But they are an interest group. Right. In, in terms of your, your um, perception that, that money does not buy votes on Capitol Hill, I think the closer you look at individual congressmen and senators, you see that that's true. Uh, most people who care enough uh, to be public servants uh, care very, very deeply about a philosophy and, 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 a, and a set of issues and, um, and are very um, uh, upset if anyone attempts to buy them off of their position. Uh, if you look at it from 3,000 miles away, where we are today, we get a different view. We see, uh, we see how it operates in the large scale. We see large money going in, as in with a credit card bill. We see legislation coming out. Um, and I, I, I suspect that both interpretations and both realities uh, are correct. Uh, it's, it's more difficult to see when you're looking at, at, um, at your own character and the character of your friends. It's a little easier to see from a distance, and that is what we see. Mr. Chairman, may I just take an extra moment? Since you mentioned the banking industry, and I'm not here to defend them, but let me give you an example of, of the mistaken perception. And this was from a member of the news media at, at uh, a meeting early on a given day. Uh, we, a reporter was talking to me about what was going to happen on the floor that day, and one of the issues was really a banks versus credit unions issue. And uh, someone asked this reporter, well, who do you think is going to win? She said, no question, the banks, they have all the money. They're, it'll be overwhelmingly in favor of the banks. And I says, watch the vote, you'll be surprised. And the vote happened, and even though the banks had spent a lot of money trying to promote their point of view, uh, the vote was something like 420 to 10 in favor of the credit unions. And uh, you know, the reporter simply assumed that money bought votes. It's not true. Can I comment on that? I find it personally offensive for people to say that because anyone gives a, a candidate a contribution that they automatically are owned by and would vote in their uh, favor. That is just not true. I know that from over 36 years of experience of distributing great amounts of, of money voluntarily contributed by individuals. The thing of it is, why would anyone support someone who didn't agree with them? Isn't it natural that if you were going to give a contribution, you would give it to someone who agreed with you? So when you look at the money that um, uh, goes into a campaign and the way a person votes, it's natural that they're going to be supported by people who support their public view. And I've often said that I think that people who look at that and make those comparisons would look at the obituary page and conclude that people died in alphabetic order. <laughs> Well, that's good news for me, Mr. Chairman, if that's true. <laughs> Mr. Mike. Not good for Mr. Burke, though. Um, Mr. Burke, you, uh, you said you supported uh, McCain, Fine, Gold, uh, and you thought it would cure some of the problems. I've got the release here of, of I guess, sent out uh, some of the provisions included in this, uh, this campaign uh, act that's proposed. We heard in the previous panel a ban on the soft money um, and testimony today from uh, the uh, former commissioner that this would even subvert money even further, and we've seen that uh, 
these rats will find some way to beat the, the rat trap we create. So on the van of the first money, there appears to be, from what we've seen, what we've heard testimony of, and from practical experience, the rats will find a way around it. The Snow Jeffords provision, the, uh, the phony ad, 60 days before an election, my campaign consultant was Dick Morris. Uh, and this is true. Yeah. I worked with Mr. Morris first in 1980 in a Senate campaign. But uh, Dick taught me one thing, get, get, raise as much money as you can, and uh, you can change people's opinion. He convinced Clinton of the same thing in the 60 days before an election. I'll bet he's just laughing at that because uh, he, he uh, developed the strategy of inoculation, and you don't do that 60 days before an election. And that's what uh, Clinton raised, the tons of money, and took it from every source possible, uh, which was concerned to people. So this, do this doesn't do anything about that, the phony ad situation. It still allows it. And I can sell you soap. I can make you buy dog food or potato chips or yogurt. <clears throat> through uh, concentrated uh, uh, media, and, uh, and that's how they're packaging issues and candidates uh, today. And the earlier on I do it, the, the tougher it is to undo. A couple of the other uh, provisions. Uh, well, you talked about the chairman getting his money from coal interest or whatever. You mentioned transportation for me. And I do serve on the Transportation Committee. Uh, does the bill do anything dealing with contributions from political action committees? No, it doesn't. Okay. And, and, and as I said, this, this begins us down a new road. It's certainly not the end of the, the, end of the road in terms of reform. Uh, frankly, public financing is, is probably um, the only comprehensive solution. Okay. And, and well, that's your, your solution. I think disclosure. Uh, People can look up on the internet and see every penny Mr. Micah got. They see the percentages I got from uh, individuals, which far exceeds anything I've gotten from PACs. They see the percentages I've gotten from within my district, within the state of Florida, uh, as opposed to outside. Um, uh, that That is uh, now disclosed, but it doesn't, uh, you, you raised it, but uh, the bill doesn't address it. Right. And, and um, in terms of disclosure, I'm sorry. If we look, let me just go through these. A clear prohibition of political fundraising on federal property. Well, that does deal with no controlling legal authority. <laughs> a clear prohibition of contributions of any sort by foreign nationals. Well, I've read the provision, and I, I tend to agree with the commissioner. Uh, the rats will find another way. Uh, uh, to uh, to infiltrate money. And, and again, a lot of this depends on the good character of the people who are running. I become more convinced that the full disclosure, and I think uh, the, the state senator here has uh, made a, a very good case for that as being one of the things that we've got to do. Uh, I, you know, you, everybody seems so concerned about how much money, and it isn't, if you look at it, at potato chips or yogurt or whatever, it isn't that much money. And I, I'm starting to think of what I've heard today. What's wrong with having business, uh, Mr. Uh, Yaws? Uh, what's wrong with having the restaurant association or those individuals from business uh, express their right about people or uh, proposals or legislation that's going to put them out of business <laughs> in a free country, why not, if it's disclosed? What's wrong with labor, someone who feels that someone is voting against them or an issue or a legislative proposal is going to detract from their wages, their income, their benefits? What's wrong with those individuals expressing it through uh, those organizations? But when it isn't disclosed, I think the harm is done. So uh, I think you all are starting to narrow me on my uh, uh, passive uh, solutions. And I'm, 
I don't think you presented a very good case uh, for this being the measure. What concerns me too is if we pass McCain Feingold, first we have to, okay, we'll take your hypothesis that we uh, let the courts decide and then the courts throw it out or even if it's in place, one, they throw it out, two, we pass in it and it's not effective. Then you have an even more dismayed public. So I'm not, I'm concerned, uh, I'm, I'm concerned that we're not doing what we need to do uh, and in if we adopt this in its present form, um, maybe you want to respond. Well, uh, yes, I will. Thank you. And briefly, um, in terms of the rats finding their way uh, through the maze, um, th that that is in fact um, the reality that we live with. And uh, money will always try to find its way to power. And so all, all we ever do are, are constantly rearranging the baffles. Um, trying to give the people a chance for another five years or another ten years. It's a constant game, and, and I think probably Common Cause in 1971 or 72 thought they could fix it uh, with a few good laws, and what we see is that um, that rearranging the baffles is something we have to do That's on a regular basis. Here. Exactly. That's exactly what we're doing here, and we're doing it on behalf of, of the individual participating in the process. Um, if, for example, your, your, your example of shouldn't a business or the restaurant association have, have the right of speech, and it absolutely should, but our grandfathers, if they had a problem with um, um, the, the smoke shop selling cigarettes to uh, the kids, would go down and, and talk to the smoke shop owner at, on Main Street. Today, you've got to deal with Brown and Williams uh, or, or, or the American Tobacco Company. In other words, and they now have full participation as a citizen. The Supreme Court says they're an individual. Congress says they can spend money like any other citizen. I can't compete with them. There's no level playing ground between me and a tobacco company. So the, the, the problem that you face, I think, as a Congress is, is how to preserve the position of the individual uh, in, in, in terms of political speech. And I think that's what, that's what we're trying to do. And it's very difficult, and it's never ending. Just one thing, and let me tell you from my personal observation, I was an aide uh, in the House. I was an aide in the U.S. Senate. I've been... My brother was a Democrat member. I'm a Republican member. I've been around the process for 20-some years. I have never seen an issue presented before any legislative body that I've viewed that doesn't have a, a well-financed, proposed, and backed pro and a, and a con. I mean, it's just inevitable that both sides, uh, and that's why it takes us so long to do anything, is because uh, it takes a long time to sort it out and to reach a consensus, and we are a consensus government. Just my final observation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Elliot, um, I would like to have your brief comments on the various cases that went before the court in your experience on campaign finance. There were many, many of them, but the most controversial had to do with express advocacy and what actually is a campaign contribution. That was one area that was, that was uh, very much in the courts. Um, the Federal Election uh, Commission itself was spanked by the courts on many occasions for over-regulating and misinterpreting uh, what the act was. And, um, I, um, I have had to vote on all of those and was often in a minority position at the commission. However, in the 23 most controversial cases that went to the courts, my view uh, won in 22 and a half cases. Uh, that is not the record of the FEC attorneys nor the Brennan Institute. Um. You probably saw the films that we all saw where President Clinton was having coffees in the White House. And they've been video they were videotaped, as many of his meetings are. Mm -hmm. And one of them he said, We figured a way to get around the law with these fifty thousand dollar chunks of money so we can heavily campaign on t television. Now, when you were in the FEC, would you have considered that videotape worthy of an investigation? I'm trying to think whether that case is closed so that I may comment on it. Let me just think for a minute. Yes, I believe that case is closed. 
Um, <clears throat> yes, I did think it was, and uh, I believe depositions were taken uh, by uh, our attorneys from any number of participants, as well as sponsors of that, as well as the sponsors of those copies, which was the Democratic National Committee. And, um, and we did rule on, on that case. What did you rule? <clears throat> we ruled that for the parts that we were investigating, there was not a violation of the law. However, we knew that other parts of that same situation were being investigated by the Justice Department. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Burke, you said that, I think in your written statement, that Tucson went to public financing of city councils, was that correct? And that actually reduced the cost of campaigning for those offices. Uh, excuse me, if I, I, I don't know that it has. It has certainly reduced the percentage that the individual has to raise in and, a given year. Well, that oh, was my point, because what you said was it has reduced the cost of campaigning. Didn't forgive you mean me. it just has shifted the cost to someone it, else? Well, it means that the average person can afford to run for city council without having rich friends. But, or, and have other people pay for it for yeah, it. That's right. Yeah. Um, you made several references. Well, first of all, you said that the McCain bill stops corporate, corporations and labor unions from, shift, from skirting the law and spending gen, general funds. Actually, you're, you're quoting the Brennan Center there. Pardon me? Well, I heard it from you. Yes. I uh, yes. Well, they're wrong. According to John McCain, they're wrong. I'll let them know, sir. Because I have spoken with him. There are three reasons for which you can put, three places to which you can put soft money under the law. One is administering your PAC. One is party building, and one is uh, communicating with your membership. When the labor unions spent in the last three cycles each $500 million, according to a study out of Rutgers University, and put 15 people in Robin Harris's district in North Carolina 8 for a year and a quarter, they paid their room and board and transportation, and that was called party building. And it's not recorded anywhere or reported anywhere, and John McCain's bill doesn't get at that. When they send out a 50-page four-color catalog on behalf of Al Gore against Bill Bradley that was called communicating with their members. Wasn't called campaigning. And they got around that law. John McCain's bill doesn't get around that. He told me that himself. So if you were relying heavily on the advice of the Brennan Center, you might want to report that to him. Thank you. You said to us from 3,000 miles away, it's much clearer what's going on in Washington. And that the implication is that we clearly do listen to the money, such as in the credit card bill. I think it's fair then to wonder who your associates are and who you respond to. If you take the top groups interested in campaign finance reform, they're the Brennan Center, Center for Public Integrity, Center for Responsive Politics, Common Cause Education Fund, League of Women Voters, National Public Radio, Public Campaign, and Public Citizen, all interested altruistically, I presume, and ultimately public funding. And I wouldn't be surprised at them wanting public funding, because when you look to see who supports these organizations, you have the Carnegie Foundation, the Florence and John Schumann Foundation, Ford Foundation, Joyce Foundation, Open Society Institute, which is George Soros's group, with which you're familiar, familiar and Pew Charitable Trusts. It would be interesting to see what else they typically fund. For just George Soros, Abortion Access Project, ACLU Foundation, Consumer Federation of America, Feminist Majority Foundation, Ms. Foundation, NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, now Legal Defense and Education Fund, National Abortion Rights Action League Foundation, Pro-Choice Research Center, Public Citizen Foundation, and the Tides Foundation. Others with these other foundations are Sierra Club and uh, Defense, the um, National Resource Defense Council. I don't find anything even reasonably middle of the road in these organizations that they're supporting. And it's always been my view that liberals like more government because that's their natural milieu, doing good with other people's money. Uh, my constituents can't wait to get home from work to coach Little League and Boy Scouts. Uh, these other constituents on the left can't wait home to write a letter to the editor, tell them what a bad actor I am. Now, I guess my question for you is, 
Oh, and they all support the Tides Foundation. Every one of these is a contributor to the Tides Foundation. You probably haven't heard of the Tides Foundation. I'm sorry, I haven't. No. Located in San Francisco, the Tides Foundation receives tax-deductible money from these four foundations and redistributes it to liberal causes, including 501c4 advocacy organizations, which is of dubious legality under the Internal Revenue Code. Part of its stated mission is to strengthen the progressive movement through grant making. And what are their principal interests? Economic justice, environmental justice, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and questioning issues, HIV AIDS, and women's empowerment and reproductive health. Now, I guess my only question to you is, are you beholden to the left here, which supports your cause, as you think I am to the bank that gave me a check on the credit union issue? Uh, Mr. Congressman, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Lunder, if you're, if you're here to, to investigate a, a San Francisco company, you're 800 miles off. Um, I'm just tying you to your friends, all right. which you're doing readily to us. Well, if, if, if it, it's like who you're related to three generations down. If you want to do that with your own campaign contributors, let's do this it. This is this year. All right. Your, your initial premise was how many of these groups' secret agenda is public financing. And um, let me suggest that we already have a massive public financing uh, system. Uh, the Cato Institute, as well as Common Cause, say that for every special interest dollar, every dollar that has an economic string attached to it that goes into campaigns today, the return is 10 to 1. Who pays for that? The taxpayers do. The taxpayers are now funding your elections by higher taxes. That's, it's, it's, it's not a left liberal uh, supposition. It's the Cato Institute uh, saying that. So uh, to the extent that you're against public financing, you're against the present system. I think that's absolutely silly, but I'll let you get away with it because you've gotten away with so much of the silliness here today. Uh, but let me just say that there are two organizations, one trying to cut taxes, one trying to keep them high, and it's not too difficult to know who they are. So you don't Thank want to answer Mr. Linder's question about the beholding. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I got wrapped up. Uh, would you, you remind you, me what his question you was? Don't. As you state that if we receive support from some group, we are beholding to them. Those who fund your group directly, the group you represent, do you feel you are beholding to them? No one funds the Arizona Good Government Association except its Arizona members. Uh, we are receive you, no funds from any group outside you, of Arizona or outside of Phoenix. Are you beholding to them? I beg your pardon? Are you beholding to the members? That fund you? Or do you? Are you beholding to the members that fund you? I, I'm telling you, there is no funds involved in our organization. It's a purely uh, volunteer organization. Public money. When you were at Common Cause, I can take this no, a step please. farther. But, oh, <laughs> well, just sort of what's good for the one is good for the other. Uh, Mr. Doolittle. Thank you. <clears throat> Obviously, Mr. Burke is involved in good government, and Mr. Linder and the rest of us are involved in special interests. Um, see, they've taken away my freedom of speech already. But the point is, we did that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, it's a left-wing morality play that special interests uh, dominate policy and government. It doesn't matter what the empirical evidence is to the contrary. This goes right back to Mr. Burke's beloved progressive era. And uh, no, no amount of facts is going to change that. And I'm not going to sit here and argue it. I just observe that the repeated academic studies that are voluminous indicate that is not the case, that uh, much greater determinants of how we vote would be, say, from our ideology, our party, um, the, the part of the country that we represent. But, see, we have to demonize money, to use a phrase Hillary Clinton used, demonize, we have to demonize the enemy in order to be able to effect our good government reforms. Senator uh, Bundegaard, I very much appreciated your testimony. If you are a member of Congress, which someday I hope you will be, you could co-sponsor the bill I'm about to introduce, because it does everything you're talking about. It totally removes these socialistic, unconstitutional limits on hard money. It requires full disclosure, puts it on the internet, and we put in there paycheck protection. And I believe that would do wonders for freedom. But it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't do wonders for the cause of more government regulation. Indeed, it would go completely in the opposite direction. Uh, Ms. Elliott, I would be interested in your observation about the following. 
Let's suppose we are so unfortunate as to have McCain Feingold or Shays Meehan become law. What, in your opinion, what an impact is that likely to have on candidate-centered speech versus non-candidate-centered speech? Well, first of all, the parties would not have the money to do all the support activities that they do for candidates. They help them obey the law. They help them in get out the vote at registration. Part of that money has to be paid for out of hard dollars if it affects a federal candidate. But the other part that helps state candidates and uh, local candidates would not be available. There just wouldn't be any money. So if there's not any money, but we observe from, and by the way, I will just observe the history of campaign reform, campaign regulation is what it really is, government regulation of campaigns, is um, you pass laws that are not enforced, which <laughs> remains the case right up until today, uh, and it's one party trying to use the law to punish the other party. Democrats did that to Republicans in 1974. We still suffer under this law. What I find is delightfully amusing is all of a sudden the Democrats have discovered, now that this is about to become law, that, oh, we get twice as much soft money as the Republicans do. This is terrible. We've got to do something about this. They have, in a very unprincipled fashion, have beaten us over the head with a bludgeon using a left-wing morality play that, you know, special interests control the Congress even though they're up to their necks and special interests themselves. And uh, now, lo and behold, the truth comes out when it really is about to become law. Oh, we can't pass that. We've got to have some changes. Did you want to uh, interject something? I wanted to say that on some of these things, the public has put a stop or at least a break uh, slowly on it. And I'm talking about the public funding of, of presidential campaigns. When it was first enacted, and in 1980, about 28% of taxpayers checked off. The last figures that I have seen, it was under 11%. And while I served at the commission, the fund went belly up. And we could not pay the amount, and it had to be raised from $1 to $3, which the, uh, which the Congress did, in rather rapid order. Then last time around, they couldn't pay the money that was due candidates um, as it was due. They only paid 34 cents on the dollar early on, and they finally made it up with the collections of, of, that are coming in this year. So it is, uh, it is a idea that perhaps had um, a good intent, but the people don't want it, and the people aren't supporting it. Uh, Mr. Uhas, could you uh, take this statement from Thomas Jefferson that the senator quoted? To compel a man, quote, to compel a man to furnish contributions of money. I've got to memorize this. this is such a wonderful quote. Uh, contributions of money for the propagation of opinions which he disbelieves is sinful and tyrannical. Um, how does that uh, comport with public, with government funding of uh, the presidential campaigns? Well, it flies in the face of it, and in particular, it flies in the face of what's been instituted here in Arizona, because as I've indicated, it's not simply the public funding of a particular candidate, but it's the public funding of, a, uh, of, a, of their opponent, um, even if, that, if their opponent, the, the individual that you choose to support, chooses not to accept that public funding. Um, I think we're, we're, we're going down a very slippery slope here in Arizona. I'm very concerned about it. I think we are going to see, as I indicated in my testimony, um, severe impact on the, uh, the two-party system. What I find fascinating is that as Mr. Burke has sat here and indicated to us that we're going to rearrange the baffles, quote-unquote, and that that will only work for about five years, but his monstrous big government campaign regulation scheme will be in force forever. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, question I had before we, unless there's other questions, we'll conclude. Uh, one quick question to the Senator. There's 7,600 uh, approximate elected state legislative officials in the country. Uh, either McCain, Feingold, or Shays Meehan would call for the federal government to basically regulate some spending and contributions, especially for voter registration, get out to vote activities. Uh, how do you feel about that? 
any opportunity that, that we can take to include people willingly into the political process is a good thing. Uh, one of the reasons that, uh, you know, from what I know of the uh, McCain-Feinco bill, one of the reasons I don't support it is because it's just more regulation and more regulation, and as I said in my comment, uh, more regulation is just creating more problems. In fact, there are um, there are some self-ascribed campaign reformers that have tripped over some of these regulations even here in our own state. Uh, the, the, the more regulation is not going to solve the problem. I agree with uh, Congressman Doolittle that uh, lifting some of the regulation uh, will be more beneficial in the long term. Uh, additionally, the political extortion's got to end. You know, compelling workers, low-income, middle-income folks, compelling them to, to donate to a political system, to people uh, whom they may disagree with, is wrong. It's wrong to do it under Arizona's clean election law, which is our public uh, financing uh, scheme here, and it's wrong to do it uh, through the uh, labor organizations. So um, anything to, that we can do to open the process, uh, add more reporting, uh, more uh, full and immediate disclosure is a good thing. I will add one thing, if you allow me, uh, because of uh, I made a quick call to the uh, or checked out the uh, Secretary of State's uh, website here in Arizona to kind of give you an idea of how much Mr. Soros contributed, uh, four hundred and eighteen thousand uh, dollars to the campaign for the uh, clean elections. That's preliminary. Um, Three hundred and thirty-three thousand from another organization called the Public Campaign Action Fund, I believe. Uh, Anyway, so you can see he, he contributed a substantial amount of money to regulating the people in Arizona. So Do we know who contributes to him? I mean, uh, no. I, I, question, I, the, question, Mr. Burke, do, do your group, are you you're publicly, you're publicly financed government money? I'm sorry. Uh, no. Uh, how are you financed? We are not. We are a volunteer group. We, we you, make you, our living else you, in other ways. You, you receive no contributions? That's correct. None? None. Uh, members don't? Pay a membership to your group Zero. or anything. Okay, uh, for Common Cause, of course, people yes. will contribute. Uh, do you think that groups like Common Cause, any group, because uh, I'm for full disclosure, period, right. do you think they should have to disclose who contributes to them? That's, that's a great question. Um, I, I think probably so, and I, I, I don't know what the, um, the proper way to do that would be, but. Um, um, and, and they're not, as I said before, giving campaign money to candidates. Uh, but because their flag is open government, it would it would be a good idea if, if they themselves were open. Um, I, I don't think there's too much secrecy involved in them, but I think some of the organizations are much more secretive than others. Uh, and, and they all ought to set a good example. Senator, do you have anything else? I mean, One other point. Um, and that is that uh, the Arizona Daily Star recently reported that of the 15 top organizations that have contributed to candidates in the state of Arizona, 10 of them were government, city, county, <coughs> other government entities. So who really is influencing the process? It wasn't, you know, even the top 10 were not business uh, organizations. They were government organizations. So I think it's a, you know it's a balance out there. To you know you want everybody in the system. No matter if I disagree with somebody wholeheartedly, the thing about our country is they have right to speak, and uh, it's just you know the American way, and that's just what bothers me so much of, of these bills placing this one's okay, this one's not. You know, this rule's for that one. This rule is different for the other. And it's just pet peeve of my eye. That's why I like full disclosure. I think it's ridiculous that a group can spend money for me, an advocacy group. And, and I don't even know how much they spent, or they spend money against me in the same scenario. And I just think the disclosure, you know, is, is good. I had one quick uh, uh, question um, for you, if I could, Ms. Elliott. Uh, one of the, and I expressed this earlier today, one of the real concerns I have is that, you know, we need rules and regulations. We need t tough fines if people violate the law, if they're misusing the money, personal use, and everything of that nature. I wholeheartedly agree. I do worry from looking back on elections 20 years ago and people starting elections and watching people running for city council and, and members, you know, go on to run for Congress. It, it's almost becoming where you have to have an attorney on staff and a, an accountant. The average citizen, if people only knew, the average citizen of this country wanting to run for Congress, it, it is just becoming more difficult. And where is that balance at where, yes, you regulate, you fine, but yet we don't want to make it so the average man and woman in this country can't even run because they're going to throw themselves in jail. I have to say that in my opinion, there is way too much regulation in the political system. 
And when you have an act that says on its first page, in the preface page, that you cannot rely on the terms of one section to another, no wonder it is mind-boggling. And uh, it would, uh, there is just plainly too much regulation. And I'll give you an example. Let's say the, a couple has a joint account and both names are on the check. The FEC would not allow a, a, a candidate or a political committee to accept that uh, only as an excessive contribution if the amount is over $1,000. They're the only place in the, in the United States that requires two signatures on a check in order to make a contribution to a federal candidate. This is just ridiculous. We have finally gotten the FEC out of the bedroom, but we certainly haven't got them out of the bank account. Just this uh, comment, uh, a friend of mine who is a businessman and was constantly complaining about government regulation uh, decided to run for office. And when he <laughs> first encountered the forms he had to fill out, the reporting he had to do, his one comment to me was, you guys did worse things to yourself than you've done to us. And with that, I want to uh, thank uh, the City of Phoenix Police Department and also our own Capitol Hill Police for being here today. All four of the panelists, uh, previous panel, appreciate your time, the uh, citizens in the audience, and also, uh, obviously, uh, all the citizens of Arizona. And I ask unanimous consent that the witnesses be allowed to submit their statements for the record and for those statements to be entered in the appropriate place in the record without objection. I also ask unanimous consent that staff be authorized to make technical and conforming changes on all matters considered by the committee at today's portion of the hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Having completed our business for today and for this hearing on campaign finance reform, the committee is hereby adjourned. Today, the Senate begins its two-week consideration of campaign finance legislation. The McCain-Feingold bill, S-27, would ban soft money contributions to political parties from corporations, unions, and individuals.